Welcome. I call this Iowa City Community School Board meeting on Tuesday, November 27th, 2018 to order. My name is Janet Godwin, and I want to thank those in the audience, those watching on YouTube, and those following on Twitter for joining us tonight. Uh, at the table with me tonight, uh, Superintendent Steve Murley, Directors Ruthina Malone, Phil Hemingway, Lori Rotland, Paul Ressler, Sean Eystone, J.P. Clausen, and Kim Colvin, Recording Secretary. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in. During community comment, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda items and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. We do have a number of community comments tonight. I'd like to remind speakers of the four-minute uh, time limit, and I will be um, keeping to that. And then one other thing I would like to comment on before the community comment section starts is that I understand that there was some um, uh, information in the, in the district today that this board, uh, t this vote tonight would actually include uh, community members. The, the vote that's occurring tonight is just for board members. There will be no vote uh, for community members participating. So I just wanted to clear that up before we moved into the agenda. So starting with community comment, first up we have Poppy Data. Um, and following Poppy will be Normal Duda. service to the community. Hope all of you had wonderful Thanksgiving break, sharing the blessings with your family and friends. Here is my family story. We immigrated to Iowa City decades ago, around 11 years ago, from two continents away. My child is born and raised here, never able to visit his extended family, reasons beyond our control. The city welcomed us with generous heart and open mind. We were finally able to call Jensen Street in Walden Woods neighborhood our home, and my son started school at Barlock Elementary in Kindergarten. Few days ago, we told him that he won't be going to Barlock from next year anymore. He was taken aback and started asking questions. Why? What happened? How about my other friends? I said most of them will continue to attend Barlock. Okay, so when can I go back to my school? He asked. I replied, never. He started crying and then asked, what did I do wrong? I failed to explain. I'm still failing. To my child, his school is indeed the safe haven and extended family, which he does never have otherwise. The only source of consistency, security, and learning, next only to his own home. He is a proud Barlock Bulldog. It is a part of his identity. In the time of critical developmental stage for a young mind, he believes in it. Just like a proud, innocent, native Iowa City citizen believes in being an Hawkeye. This reasoning will segregate my child from his second home, where he has already made a successful connection of growth, stability, and nurturing. This action will uproot a tender mind and punish him for the rest of his life, a trauma for the whole family, being tagged and socially segregated from a community he calls his own. Substantial amount of reports worldwide has clearly indicated that move of school could trigger psychological trauma, especially for younger children, leading to compromised social psychological well-being, hence need to be avoided whenever possible practically. Addressing overcrowding issues in Barlog along with establishing and enhancing diversity and socioeconomic equality district-wide can be addressed in a constructive way. As shown in the October 23rd draft of the board, without chopping off our neighborhood from the Barlock community. The details board is more than aware than mine. Also, grandfathering current students, already a common practice in many neighborhoods, assures basic psychological well-being of the child and continuity of the system for a limited means family like myself. And remember, that will uproot the sole cause so-called shopping around for good school. We all agree, right kind of change needs to be started for sustainability and equity. In a dynamic society like Iowa City, dezoning rather than rezoning is the long-term option. However, uprooting children from his or her second home 
is not a mere change when other options are available. It is a trauma to a delicate mind and the family. Needless to say, in this case, avoidable. <coughs> it seems to be practically avoidable and already suggested by board around four weeks ago. We need to think about current problems in present time, not comparing with a past scenario more than half a decade ago. The realities of the families of the neighborhood and the communities have changed completely. For a family like me, a lot of us in my neighborhood, both parents working full time with limited means. We won't be able to send our child to any school anymore if we lose our spot in schools after school program. Thank and you, Poppy. We've reached the four minute limit. Thank you for your comments tonight. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, followed by Nirmal Duda and Li Jia following. Hi, good evening. I am Nirmal Dutta from the Walden Hill Woods neighborhood. I am also father of my son, Neil, just mentioned by my wife, Poppy. So we are here today to address some of the concerns we already sent to the boards and several ways several times, that there are certain issues that really shake our community, our neighborhoods in the Walden Hills. Majority the psychological imbalance, which Poppy has already mentioned, there is other major issue that the instability of the community's minds. That is, these kids, some of their young, older siblings are uprooted before from the Weber, going to the Barlock, make their homes, and now their younger siblings are again uprooted from the Barlock, being back to the Weber, again bring the same trauma to the family and the friends. They are losing their friends in the school, they are losing their friends in the community and the neighborhoods as well. And second, there is also an issue about the rezoning or including the diversity. But keep in mind that to include the diversity population from some other neighborhoods to into the neighborhood, we are basically taking parts of that neighborhood into three parts, sending one of their kids next door to the one school, another kids in the next door to the one school, and there are some kids in their own school. So basically, in the means of diversity, we are taking part their own community at the same time is disturb the three other schools in the west side, Barlog, Horn, and Cueva. So. That is also a big concern. And about the transportation, definitely we are going to lose the basic transportation for the kids who are going to take the bus in the morning, come back to the home in the afternoon, and some of them also stay by the BSP program, which also we're going to lose because the waiver had its full extent, 130 spot is filled, and there's 32 waiting lists. We already confirmed from the their BSP program coordinators. And there is no spot for these new kids who are going to transfer, and as a working parents, we are really, really don't know what to do at the afternoon, who is going to stack the job, who is going to come back home for the kids. And about the integration of the diversity, which already in the boards concerned, there is an option that is called the pairing. I think that's also a good possibility that they bring the kids from the one school to another two, two major school and then bring them together, grow them together, and that's also cause their minds to be diverse. And the last thing is that my personal experience about this diversity, whenever we take part these kids from their own roots and send them to the others, are they really mixed together? Because my son is really very nice, talkative child and very social. He talked with everybody in his class. Last year, we sent a thank year birthday no, invitation to all of his friends. Very unfortunate. No of his friends from that community, or particular that color, came so up. He is not friend of them, or he is, they are actually not like to be friend with us, or we are really not the same. So just bringing the diversity in the classroom is not the whole thing. We have to bring the diversity in our community, in our living spaces. We are sealed our living boundaries along with the high rent houses. We don't bring them in our living space, but we are just living, bring them in our classroom. That probably could not help us in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Li Jia, followed by Shuang Chen. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Le Jia. I'm a Barlock um, student's parent, and I'm also a Chinese teacher. Today, I'm here to bring you a letter from a student of mine. Her name is Teresa. 
She planned to come here and give her speech, but she doesn't feel well today. I f her mom sent this letter to me via email, and I feel it's my responsibility to bring the letter to you. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa, a third grader now at Bullock. I was told I will have to go to Weber next year. It is very sad news for me, and I hope people know what I feel about it. In my past four years at Bullock, I become best friends with my classmates and kids from other grades. We do projects together, have lunch together, play kickball and chess together, and enjoy every moment with each other. I love to come to school every day and see familiar faces of our dear teachers and friends. My teachers and friends know me as a special person, not just as a number count. I know I can be myself in front of them and feel at home in school. What breaks me my heart, what breaks my heart is, if I go to Weber, I will never be able to attend my current after school program. I learned so much Chinese at this program and I'm very close to the teachers and friends there. It is like my second home at Iowa. Every day, my friends and I wait at the door of the school for our teachers to pick us up. Then we will walk to the, our houses of the after school. We chat, we sing, we sing, and we laugh all the way. It is always the sweetest memory for me. As an American from a Chinese family, I feel lucky to be able to learn Chinese. I really hope that I can continue to learn Chinese and contribute to both American and Chinese culture. Therefore, I hope people could understand my situation. Please listen to our voices and give us a stable place to study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Shuang Chen, followed by Tiffany Olson. I'm also from the Warden Woods neighborhood, so I'm also here to voice the serious concerns uh, our people had over the uh, redistricting of the boundary, moving our neighborhood to Web from Borla to Weber. Um, and also, I emailed the board about the concerns before Thanksgiving, uh, and I really appreciate the board members who replied my uh, email and provided the opportunity to. Uh, discuss this issue, um, and uh, I also watched the um, video recording of the November 13th board uh, meeting, and I under totally understand the well-meaning of the board to move our neighborhood back because uh, seven or eight years ago, our neighborhood would, would move from Weber to Borak, and, that, and that, at that point, the people were not willing to move. So then board members probably thought that we would feel good about being able to move back to Weber. Uh, but I have to point out that uh, this is actually not the case. The unwillingness to move was not related to a particular school, but instead it's related to providing stability to our children. I think some of our neighbors before me already stated that uh, in their very strong voice, so I will not reiterate that. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say, it, uh, instability really will harm the emotional well-being of our children, uh, and also eventually it will affect their educational well-being. Uh, over the Thanksgiving break, uh, seeing the uh, anxiety hovering over our neighborhood among the children is really disheartening. Um, so, uh, therefore, that's the departure point of my further comments. Um, since we are going through all these pains, we definitely will care about the game. Um, and we totally understand the mission of the board to promote diversity and promote <coughs> equality across the district. However, if we look at the, um, this um, uh, building blocks and the change in the percentages of the um, uh, free and reduced lunch families in each in each school, uh, we really feel, I um, don't mean to disappoint you, but we do feel that uh, the gain is not compatible with uh, all the pains we have to go through. Um, so like the Kirkwood, uh, yeah, uh, so we'll have a reduction of 7.5% of free and reduced lunch families. Uh, I know it's a, 
uh, already a great progress. Uh, however, we have to also to notice that uh, the free and reduced lunch percentage in Kirkwood is still 70%. Um, based on this, I, I was wondering uh, if the board can really take in, into consideration the well-being of our children and also at the same time to achieve equity and equality across a school, di school district. Uh, for example, could the board open a discussion about alternative plans? Uh, so, yeah, since we noticed that in, some, in the school district, some schools actually had uh, a really low and very consistently low percentage of free and reduced lunch families, like uh, in terms of the Carville area, like, Car like sorry, we can. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, the uh, school district can consider the plan about passing the students from Kirkwood to Wickham, which can maintain the uh, stability of the existing school communities, but at the same time uh, solve the problem of the disparity in the free and reduced lunch uh, family. And also another alternative plan would be uh, go back, going back to the October 23rd plan that our neighborhood is still with the uh, Bola community. Thank you, that's my point. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Um, Tiffany Olson, followed by Matt Newkirk. My name is Tiffany Olson. My husband and I have lived in the Walden Hills neighborhood on Emily Court for the past nine years. We actually have five children ages four through 13. My oldest son is currently an eighth grader at Northwest Junior High, and he was moved from Weber to Borlaug in second grade when Borlaug opened in 2012. I currently have a sixth, fourth, first, and preschooler enrolled at Borlaug. I'm in full support of all the concerns already presented by the members of my neighborhood tonight and in an email that was sent to the board members and the superintendent earlier in the past couple days concerning the proposed boundary changes for Walden Hills next year. I remember attending meetings back in 2012 when Borlaug was opening and there were drawing boundaries for the new school. Our biggest concern then was that as Borlaug started reaching capacity, we would then be moved back to Weber. We raised that concern and were assured that that would not happen. Switching schools then was an adjustment for our family. It affects families to move school communities, though we understood the reasoning behind the move and realized with building a new school, attendance areas needed to be adjusted. We adjusted our work schedules and lives to adapt and have spent the past six years developing wonderful relationships with the teachers, staff, students, and other families attending Borlaug. Our children are thriving and we are very concerned as parents to uproot them along with the other families in our neighborhood to a new school community. My father is in the military and I moved around a lot as a child. We are choosing to stay in our current home despite the smaller space for a family of seven because of the stability it provides for our children. They can attend the school with teachers and staff they have grown up with, interacting with, and our family has strong bonds with. I work as a substitute teacher and have subbed in many schools around the district, and the teachers and staff do a wonderful job at providing a school community where it is more than just one classroom teacher that affects and nurtures a child. It's an entire staff that works together from year to year to bring those children to their best potential. Part of making a difference is developing relationships and establishing routines in a community of familiarity. This cannot happen if neighborhoods are continually being moved from school to school. That community and stability has the ability to have a greater impact rather than small adjustments in low SES, ELL, and special ed percentages on paper. Currently, there is not a new school being built in our area, and the percentages are very similar between Borlaug, Weber, and Horde. Please keep families in their school communities so they can continue to develop strong relationships and have that stability. With the housing growth and development occurring in the Weber area, it's very possible that it will hit capacity and then our neighborhood will be moved yet again to another school. So my younger children could be moved twice and attend up to three schools even though we are living in the same home. I understand and support the district goal to even low SES percentages district-wide. This proposed plan makes little difference towards that goal, but has a very great impact on families. It seems to just be moving low SES percentage areas from one school to another. If the goal is to balance SES, 
and even attendance numbers, why not move attendance areas in Coralville up to the northern Wickham area with lower capacity and a lower SES percentages? I realize Weber is a wonderful school with caring and capable teachers and staff, but to uproot children and families from a school they've been building relationships for the past six years to equate a very small difference in numbers will likely completely change and be different in upcoming years as the area grows is not in the best interest of children from any background, especially for those from a lower SES background that relationships of trust build over time and can have the greatest impact. Along with evening district percentages among schools, I believe that the school district should strive to provide as much stability and keep children and families in their school communities as long as possible. Thank you, Tiffany. Matt Newkirk, followed by Jonathan Landon. I, I'm Matt Newkirk. Uh, I sent this email out earlier today, but I just wanted to uh, voice it at the meeting. So my family resides at 2058 Little Creek Lane in Iowa City, and that address has been assigned to Roosevelt, then Horn, then Weber School in the past six or seven years. Um, currently three of my four children attend Weber. I have a kindergartner, a second grader, and a fourth grader. My youngest child is one, and he won't be starting kindergarten until 2022. My oldest two began their education at Horn. Less than two years ago, we made the move from Horn to Weber as we were asked to do. It wasn't painless, but Weber is, as Horn was, a place where my kids can thrive. All the schools here, for the most part, are places where the kids can thrive, so that's not the issue. Now that the board is planning to move our neighborhood back to Horn, I must ask, why were we moved in the first place? Were goals accomplished? Does it make sense that we are being asked to move back two years later? The stress of a move is real, so we should be sure that our goals for doing so are meaningful, are clear, and are actually being fulfilled. These moves certainly disrupt the community, the friendships, and the sense of stability for students and their families at the affected schools. It only seems natural to me to be skeptical that moving children every two years would benefit in meaningful change, or would result in meaningful and beneficial change. Even in the most exceptional people, and I think you're hearing from exceptional people, there does not exist a wellspring of resilience. So I inquire, why continue to ask our children and families to draw upon our ability to endure transitions and to wonder if this will be our last move? I'm aware that the board is considering allowing students in my neighborhood currently enrolled at Weber to stay there through a grandfathering process. I do appreciate that this is under consideration and I do feel like uh, the board is trying to do the right thing for us. Uh, unfortunately, the remedy that is proposed does not fit the needs of all families that I assume it is intended to serve. Because I have a young child still at home, this will force me to pick between a difficult and I think unnecessary move back to Horn or eventually enroll two of my children in separate elementary schools. Does the board see this as an acceptable choice? Yes, I do not. An acceptable remedy is entirely within your power to grant allow all of my children to remain together at Weber through a grandfathering process. I ask you to extend the grandfathering not to just the current students, but to the affected households, future students as well. The barrier to the remedy I seek, it seems, is a precedent made by the board in regards to the Scanlon Farms attendance areas. I ask, is this really a precedent that you want to keep? In effect, it treats families with current and future students who are not school-aged as an encumbrance that will hamper your ability to plan for the district's future is a precedent that sees fit to separate children and burden parents without benefiting the district in a way that is equal to the harm that it causes families. I admit that extending this grandfathering to all my children will lengthen the accommodation and the work that goes into putting it into place, but I don't think that this is an onerous, unnatural, or even a perpetual burden to place upon the district. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, followed by Allison Hansen. Hi, um, John Landon, 2205 Abbey Lane. Um, I'm here again last, last week or last month I, I talked about this letter. I, I did want to just pass it around. I, I don't think you actually got to see it. Um, you guys can have a look. That's, that's a letter from my seven-year-old begging for her three-year-old to be able to go to the same school. I'm a Weber family now, our family's a Weber family, and now we're being asked to, to move back to Horn. I understand there's a grandfather, and that's, I echo Matt's um, 
Mr. Matt's comments. I appreciate that accommodation. Uh, my request is is that, in fact, the entire family be able to stay together. Um, I sat through the last meeting. It was it was really informative, and I, I, I commend you in your work. This is very challenging. I, I don't. I, I and I think that what we're trying to do here as a community is really important and good. Um, and I, I heard a lot of rationales for various decisions on, on where a boundary might be and where a boundary might not be. Uh, and, and many of them were like, well, we, we want to make sure that neighborhoods stay together, right? We can't, we don't want to draw, uh, draw a line that, that isolates a particular household in a neighborhood. We try and find um, natural boundaries and barriers and, and make decisions that, that make sense based on geography and, um, and neighborhoods. What, what I'm seeing here in this grandfathering policy, it just slices right through a family. To me, a family ought to be the most fundamental boundary that you're paying attention to, a natural boundary, to, to, to create a rule that, that potentially breaks up a family and, and where kids are going to school, the shared experiences. I mean, my, my, my kindergartner, when I brought her to school, she was crying every day for the first three weeks, right? The only, the only way she was consoled is because her bigger sister was there to walk her in the door. Um, that, that's, it's, it's unnecessary to, to create a rule here that, that, that doesn't allow the, these siblings to, to have this shared experience. Um, so, and, and, and I, I also understand that it's a challenge to craft such a policy, right? Because there's unintended, unintended consequences, Pandora's boxes. Um, and, and, and whatnot. I, I, I have shared with, with Director Hemingway some proposed language that I think is curtailed and, and would, would allow this transfer policy to extend to siblings only in situations where you have kids in the same school at the same time in elementary school. It's not, it's not a broad, open-ended policy. Um, I'm happy to share the, that proposed language with, with the board if, if crafting such a, a policy is something that you're, in fact, interested in. Uh, similarly, the Scallon Farms precedent, it, you guys have the power to, uh, 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 to change that. That, that. That's within your purview. I don't understand or know the backstory behind that, but I'm quite certain it was not a, a situation where families did what they were supposed to, followed the rules, changed schools, weren't the noisy. I mean, we could have easily been the noisy objectors, and, and some, like some of my neighbors were. And then we would be we'd be actually better off in a better situation. I wouldn't have to be worrying about my kids getting split up because of a, vol a voluntary transfer policy. If if we w if we had kind of been objectors and, and done the voluntary transfer and stayed at Horn in the first place, instead we 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 bucked it up. Said you guys know what you're doing. We're gonna we're gonna follow along just like uh, you, you know trust trust your judgment. And now we're getting stuck, and that that just doesn't seem right. To so you guys do have the ability to, to make it right. Uh, I, I recommend or commend you to, to consider the proposed language that would, that would fix this problem. Uh, and I mean, it doesn't just have to be for Horn River. It could be for uh, all the other families of these other, Lincoln to Penn, Van Allen to Wickham, Wickham to Penn. You, you got lots of, lots of exceptions that we've crafted kind of because of the, the noisy complaints. We can fix them all right here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Allison Hansen, followed by Kun Lee. So I'm another um, family who went from Weber to, or went from Horn to Weber two years ago. I want to go back to Horn. And, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to get emotional, but you know, I do want to point out one thing is when we went to Weber, we had three kindergartners that went to first grade over there. You think they put them in the same class? No, they were all separated so that when they went to that school, it was all new kids, all new faces. So I'm really, really, really concerned about the psychosocial aspect of just keeping shuffling them around, you know, because like everyone here has kind of mentioned, we picked a house, we thought we, that would be in a school. We, you know, if I wanted to embrace change nonstop, I would move all the time or I would pick different you know things but I'm really really concerned about our kids building relationships with friends with even teachers in the respect and learning rules and having to change schools all the time and what's the guarantee that it's not going to happen again in two years I'm also a family that if there is an open enrollment option I have a child not in school yet and I can't have two in one grade school and one in another because 
that open enrollment option isn't available for them. We also are part, we use the summer and after school program. So then they'll be segregated all year. The two brothers will be in this school and one brother will be in this school th even through the summer because they don't, you have to be in that school to be in that summer program. And so I just want you to take that into consideration when you're making these decisions on the um, being able to open enroll and taking the whole family, if that's an option. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kun Lee? Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, I, I did not prepare to speak here before I come here. Uh, my, we, I'm from the Weldon Hill uh, District 2. I live in the Irving Avenue. Uh, first I knew uh, our uh, school will be changed from Bullock to Weber. I told my son. My son's first response to me is, okay, Dad, I want to bet you if I transfer to Weber. Um, and uh, I do not prepare to speak, uh, but uh, uh, today, you know, in Bullock, uh, they're using a software called the Seesaw to share everything the children write or something in the school. Today I got a picture from his teacher. That was my son writing the journal. He said, dear friends, please go to a meeting tomorrow so we will get school, uh, switch to Weber or other schools. If you want to stay, please go to the meeting. Uh, thank you by William. So I think I, I just want to st stand here to speak for him. So when I got home, I won't get bad for him, by him. And um, he told me that in the school, that everyone is sad when they knew the news. Our children in the school now know this. He said, everyone is sad because everyone, even they don't stay in the block, they are not happy because they have friends have will move to another school. My son is very, very sad. His best friend notice will stay in the school, and he had to move to a new school. Uh, another issue I want, want to stick is yeah, as, a, as a parent. Uh, my wife and I both work in the University of Iowa. Uh, we have to work uh, full time. And I know many parents in our neighborhood also have uh, uh, both parents need to go to work. So BSP is a way to help us. Uh, so another issue is we got a, a news from the, uh, the BSP program said uh, because the web or the BSP already been full, so there's no opening for us. So if you transfer us to next year to the uh, to the web, a big issue for us is what's what's going to do with us for 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 our parents both will go to work. There's no bus system in our neighborhood too. There's a one mile between one to two miles, so there's no bus. I my son is only in second grade. My my daughter will go to the school next year. He's uh, she is in kindergarten. So I, I'm not feel very like comfortable to let them walk one mile, two mile to home and uh, just stay alone at home. So I have no idea because I just got the news from the BSP program uh, very soon. I have no idea what to do next. So I have no plan for that. I hope you have a plan or have a, can help us find a way if you want to transfer us from Bullock to Weber because of, um, that's a big issue for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes community comment. Thank you all for coming and sharing your concerns um, and, and wishes. Apologies when I log back into my computer. Um, we're at agenda setting, is that correct? Um, I, want, I want to propose that we swap the order of Action items on voluntary transfer and attendance area, taking attendance area first with voluntary transfer second. I actually would like to move all of the action items ahead of the consent agenda and take care of that while the community's here. I'm fine with that. And, and so we move all the actions up. I still would like to switch the order of um, voluntary transfer and attendance area. Do you need a, was that a motion or? I need a motion. I move that we move all the action items up and swap the voluntary transfer and attendance zones. Thank you. Do you want to put uh, 
programmable mm -hmm. studies down, down to, to yes. so okay. move yeah. those two things up above everything else okay. and I'll everything follows sorry I thought I'll second that, was clear. that. <laughs> we're ready to vote <clears throat> online voting is open All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. So we will move right into the action items um, with the first up being attendance area. Huh. Sorry? Like yes. Yep. That would be great. I'd actually like to go ahead and make a motion to approve the attendance area blocks as presented. A second. Steve, you want to walk us through um, the latest? All right, I'm going to uh, walk through. I know that uh, this is very familiar to all of you as board members because you've been working on it for a long time, but there may be people uh, in the audience uh, or on TV that have not seen this. So if you'll just bear with me, I'll just give you a quick overview of some of these slides, especially for those that uh, are watching this maybe for the first time. Uh, so on uh, slide two, uh, you have a comparison of the current attendance areas with the current voluntary transfer uh, language in place, uh, and that is compared to the uh, 2019-20 attendance areas as approved by the board in the spring of 2016 uh, absent voluntary transfer based on uh, the action of the board uh, to change that policy and uh, you have uh, the columns are consistent going across to show the enrollment of the schools of the students in the school the percentage of students that are low uh, socioeconomic status the percentage of students that uh, participate in our English language learner program and the percentage of students that qualify for special education see a capacity number for the district and then the percentage of uh, utilization uh, given that uh, standard. Slide three uh, shows you, uh, again, the current attendance areas on the left side. Uh, the right side now shows the new revised attendance areas that the board has been working on, uh, again, with the new uh, voluntary transfer language that the board adopted in place. And then uh, this was a slide that the board asked for a couple meetings ago oops, uh, that shows uh, the 2019-20 numbers uh, as approved by the board in the spring of 16 on the left hand side and then the changes that would result uh, in the uh, uh, various iterations that the board has gone through uh, including the maps that are presented today. Uh, this uh, shows you the difference between the current uh, in blue uh, percentage of students uh, that are uh, low socioeconomic status uh, and then in orange uh, the proposed attendance areas uh, that the board has been working on uh, for 1920. And then this slide shows the change between today uh, and between those proposed attendance areas uh, for students that uh, are low socioeconomic status showing both gains and losses uh, in each school. Walking through the maps, uh, each of the maps has the same uh, characteristics on it. That is uh, the line that is in the bright yellow uh, is the one that is proposed uh, for next year. Uh, the lines that are in red uh, show you the uh, boundary that was approved by the board uh, in the spring of 16. Uh, and the color itself uh, is the current attendance area. So uh, I, again, uh, looking at Alexander here, uh, this would be the proposed attendance area for 2019-20. This red line out here, as you follow this along, this actually uh, uh, shows you uh, the proposed attendance area uh, for 2019-20 is approved by the board so you can see that there's an area over here which would have been included in Alexander and that's part of the Lake Ridge neighborhood and then this pink area is uh, the actual area that exists today so in this map uh, you see the students that are uh, current Alexander students uh, these students are moving out of the Alexander attendance area these were proposed Alexander students that would not be moved into the Alexander attendance area over here uh, on the left hand side uh, at the bottom row uh, shows you the proposed live-in enrollment numbers for 2019-20 in each of the demographic categories and the percent utilization at the end of the uh, facilities master plan uh, construction process uh, in the fall of 21. So no significant changes to Alexander uh, over the last few rounds uh, of our discussion. Uh, Borlaug, you've heard quite a bit about this uh, from folks tonight. 
Uh, one of the major changes for Borlaug is the move of the Boston Way neighborhood uh, on the northeast corner uh, to Borlaug in order to make room for those students. Uh, the students that uh, are up here on the northeast corner and the students on the southeast corner were moved out, um, respectively to Lincoln uh, and to Weber. Coralville Central, uh, this area here, uh, part of the current uh, Coralville Central area was moved to uh, Lincoln, uh, and that uh, this is a, a new development that's going in. We also have a lot of new development going in uh, in the Iowa River Landing. Uh, we know that there will be additional capacity available in Lincoln, uh, and so this allows room for those students to grow into Lincoln. Garner, this is part of a change that the board made last spring, uh, and uh, uh, you can see that it went from significantly over capacity. Uh, to uh, a more acceptable utilization number, and that's with the opening of the Christine Grant Elementary School. Here you have the Christine Grant Elementary attendance area, uh, and uh, this yellow area in between the, or inside this island, uh, currently assigned to Garner, uh, results in uh, the major loss of uh, the Garner population in that previous slide, uh, and helps to provide uh, uh, both uh, adequate uh, capacity utilization at Grant and some room for growth. Hills Elementary School, uh, initially in one of the iterations that came before the board, uh, we'd actually look to reduce the uh, number of students there so that um, uh, the capacity was uh, slightly smaller so that we had more space in the building for utilization of the weighted resource allocation model. After a lengthy meeting with the staff out there um, and uh, many conversations about uh, the role of efficiency and having enough uh, students in the building to effectively utilize their specials population. Uh, the decision was made uh, to add those students back into Hills. Um, the portion of Hills that does uh, wind up transferring out is the north uh, portion here, which winds up moving into the Longfellow District. Uh, Hoover, uh, and uh, this uh, school currently houses Mann and Lincoln. Um, as it gets its own attendance area, it will absorb part of the Longfellow attendance area that's in green here, part of the Lemmy attendance area that's in brown, part of the Lucas attendance area that's in tan, uh, and part of the um, Alexander attendance area that's in pink down here. Um, the major change between this and the 2016 approved uh, portion of it is the area that uh, is along Herbert Hoover Highway up here. This is part of the grindstone development. Um, the previous iteration of this map had the line coming across here. That was before that development was actually moving forward when that uh, decision was made by the board. Uh, absent that change, uh, you'd actually have some of the students on the north end of that um, subdivision going to one school and kids on the south end of the subdivision going to a different school with buses running through there. And then the other area, and this has been in here for several uh, iterations now, uh, this area of Longfellow, uh, that, or I'm sorry, Lemmy rather, uh, that was uh, reassigned to Hoover. Uh, in uh, oh, about two months ago when we went through that process. Uh, Horn Elementary School, uh, again, uh, this is the neighborhood down here which uh, several of our community commenters uh, spoke to earlier tonight. Um, you see the demographics in terms of the numbers of the students and the grade levels of the students that currently live uh, in this area uh, that are assigned to Weber uh, that would be reassigned uh, to Horn. Uh, an area uh, over here on the east side of Horn uh, is actually part of that area then that's reassigned to Lincoln. Kirkwood Elementary School, uh, we've got an area over here on the west side of the district. This is the Boston Way neighborhood. I don't think we came up with a name for this neighborhood, did we, Laurie, when we were going through it? But uh, this uh, area here uh, between 12th and uh, 23rd, uh, and those students are moved out, these students to Borlaug, these students to Wickham. Um, that helps us uh, right-size the building uh, as we utilize the weighted resource allocation model. Uh, we were very crowded in there right now. There's a series of modular units parked on the east side of the Kirkwood campus. Uh, and this will allow us to move those off. Lemmy, this map's a little bit hard to see uh, just because of the scale. Uh, you see down here this very small area, this is the Breckenridge neighborhood. Uh, this is currently uh, zoned to Lemmy. It was moved out uh, in 2016, uh, and several months ago the board, uh, through discussions, determined to maintain those students at Lemmy. Uh, and again, that was part of the rationale for this area uh, being moved to Hoover so that we could make room for those students. Lincoln Elementary School, uh, initially this area right here is the Forest View area and it was part of the uh, new Lincoln attendance area approved in 2016. Uh, the board made a decision to uh, retain these students at Mann uh, and uh, when that happened that pushed the population uh, at Lincoln down below 150 students. 
Uh, so part of our discussion and work sessions uh, subsequent to that was to look for both current and future students uh, that could be added to the Lincoln attendance area in order to ensure that we uh, got uh, at or near that uh, 200 number for that operational efficiency. Again, a uh, portion of the Coralville attendance area with both some current but uh, especially future development areas um, out here near the 100 acre wood and the um, Iowa River Landing uh, where uh, current development is going on and then also uh, parts of Coralville uh, here south of Highway 6 um, in Borlaug and then uh, this portion of uh, the eastern part of the Horn attendance area. Longfellow. Uh, Longfellow lost uh, a large portion of students on the east side of the district that now go to Hoover. Uh, we'll see them absorb some of the current that, students that are at current Hoover, um, plus they will also uh, uh, accommodate the uh, move from the Lake Ridge uh, neighborhood, which was originally slated to move into Alexander, but uh, due to significant overcrowding that that would have caused, are now uh, moved into Longfellow. Just for reminders, we went through the room. Uh, remodeling and renovation at Longfellow, we were able to recapture several rooms, so that helped us increase the capacity there, and that makes room for the students uh, that we would move into Longfellow. Um, Lucas Elementary School, uh, you see the area on the east side here, that's part of the rezoning to the new Hoover uh, Elementary School. Uh, Mann, uh, Mann absorbs uh, some students from uh, current uh, Hoover, uh, a handful of students here uh, that are in current um, Longfellow. Uh, I'd point out that uh, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion about uh, this street here that is north of City High uh, and which direction the house faced uh, and which neighborhood it was a part of. Um, so you can see now that that line drops down uh, so that it actually uh, orients the house towards the street on which the uh, driveway and garage is as opposed to where it backs up. Uh, Penn Elementary School, uh, at, with the opening of Christine Grant, you can see oops, that the area on the north side of Penn is lost uh, to Christine Grant, uh, and so Penn now absorbs a portion of the uh, northern uh, Wickham attendance area and the northern Lincoln attendance area. Uh, you'll note that uh, uh, the capacity there is about 69%, 68%, and part of that is because uh, we know that there's quite a bit of growth and development that's going on north and northwest uh, of the high school at this point in time. Uh, and we anticipate that uh, this will allow us uh, to accommodate those students as they move into elementary school. Uh, Shimmick, uh, largely unchanged uh, uh, from its uh, current attendance area. Uh, this was part of the 2016 attendance area. Again, uh, that attempt to use geographical uh, uh, boundaries uh, in the attendance uh, uh, development process. You can see this now follows the road, so you get a small number of students uh, that uh, are currently manned students that will now be assigned to Shimmick. Uh, Twain Elementary School, uh, again one of our schools that's significantly overcrowded. Uh, I know many of you have uh, heard us talk about the library at Shimmick, which we actually had to build a classroom in and we've now segregated the back half of the class or the library to use for, um, I'm sorry Twain, um, back half of the library to use for our Title I and reading recovery programs uh, and uh, we unfortunately have art on a cart uh, right now in Twain, so right-sizing this building will allow us uh, to put art back in the classroom uh, and uh, to move those students out of the library and back into classrooms. Uh, Van Allen, uh, quite a bit of discussion at the board table about the south uh, part of the attendance area. Oops. Uh, and uh, this back in 15-16 was zoned into Wickham, uh, now been returned to Van Allen. Uh, so you can see Van Allen retains essentially the same attendance area uh, that it has today. Uh, and oops, and there was a conversation about uh, busing at uh, one of our previous meetings. Um, we do have a uh, pay-to-ride bus uh, right now that uh, transports students uh, from this neighborhood to Van Allen. Um, there was a concern that the students that live down here at the south end might be beyond the two-mile limit and require transportation, uh, and those students could be routed on the pay-to-ride bus, uh, which would not require the addition of a bus for that neighborhood. Weber Elementary School, uh, again, we've heard from uh, quite a few uh, people who are here tonight about uh, this transition. Uh, so as you look at it, obviously Weber is a very large geographic uh, uh, elementary attendance area, so I think it helps to oops, look at this uh, blown up portion of it down here. Um, so this is Pheasant Ridge, if you're familiar with the neighborhood, uh, Fairway and uh, that mall is right here. Um, Benton Street is right here, so there's a gas station right here if you're familiar with that. Um, so that helps you see uh, the area there that was moved back. Again, these students are moved out of Borlaug to make way for the students that were moving into Borlaug um, from Boston Way. 
uh, Wickham. Uh, Wickham lost the northern part of its attendance area here uh, to uh, Penn Elementary School uh, and then uh, added uh, the students that are down here uh, on the west side of the Kirkwood attendance area. Uh, wood, uh, and uh, again, you can see the red line over here. Uh, so uh, back in 1516, uh, the decision was made to take this area that's over here and move that into wood uh, from Alexander uh, in re-examining the utilization of uh, capacity at wood with the implementation of the weighted resource allocation model. Adding those students in would have significantly overcrowded wood. Um, so those students are now uh, slated to go to the new Hoover. Um, this area down here uh, is uh, part of the current Alexander attendance area uh, and will go to wood. Um, just a reminder, when we went through the attendance uh, process to open Alexander up, there was some significant concern from parents that live down here that they actually, if you think about the transportation patterns, have to come up here and pass wood in order to come down to Alexander. Um, so this uh, then gives them the opportunity to attend the closest school um, from a driving standpoint. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, comments, questions? I know board members have got a lot of things they want to discuss. Um, I don't have questions, but I just have some comments that I wanted to make um, before we move to potentially a vote. Um, and I had to write them down because I know I'm kind of scatterbrained sometimes, so I forget things. So bear with me as I read it. Um, and this is not, I, this is for my fellow board members, but also those listening in the audience and on various sites. Um, as a board member, I am committed to working to make decisions taking into account the entire community of children that we serve within our public educational system. That means it has to be decisions that benefit the greater good for 13,974 students and not just the upper, middle, or lower socioeconomic kiddo or the brown, black, or white one but the, and very other races that fit within there, but the greater good for all of them. Boundary discussions and ultimately decisions are never easy because there will always be people who feel that they are being asked to make too many changes while others are being protected from many. It's unfortunate that these changes have been labeled as such. I can't speak to past changes that I wasn't a part of the decision-making process for. However, I will say it has been my impression and belief that as a board, we didn't want to throw out all of the work from 2015-16 that a previous board and the community did in preparation for the 1920 attendance zone changes. Instead, we saw this as an opportunity to tweak areas in order to continue to address the fact that we are one of the fastest growing districts in the state and that after years upon years of discussing it, we remain woefully segregated by income levels and race in many of our schools. And as a side note here, this doesn't mean moving around poor black children, because we have children at or below the poverty line of many races. And we also have children of color that fall within the middle to upper class within our district. The proposed boundaries do not go far enough for me, but I recognize that we can't dismantle decades of segregated learning environments in one fell swoop that won't include a deliberate review for each school and their student populations that can be impacted. I do pledge as a board member to continue working with other board members as well as the administration and the community to get us towards additional measures changes, alignments that will position this board to offer truly equitable educational experiences, no matter what your family's income level or race might be. Change is never, never easy. I know from my experience as a former Iowa City Community School District parent, a spouse of a teacher, and the product of Chicago public school systems, how it can affect all directly and indirectly involved. I do believe that we have spent quite a significant amount of time discussing almost all of the changes before us that our building administrations and teachers and staff will be prepared to make any transitions children and families will have and to, to ensure they go as smoothly and seamlessly as possible. 
In addition, the board has repeatedly stated that this is the beginning of this work as we have dealt with tweaking moves that were planned, that some were planned for the 1920 school year. This means that we are not actively working to protect any schools or populations, but dealing with changes that were already set to happen in many cases with the small number of new changes that have been discussed for months. I also hope that when people see their demographics changing, it's not a reason to label it as us busing poor black students. As my em email inbox can attest that these changes have impacted varying ranges of families. Lastly, as a community, I hope that we realize that change will continue to happen as we work to better balance our public schools that are meant for all within our community for which we live and for what I serve as a board member. I want to thank all of those that have emailed and telephoned, even the callers that have choose to stoop to personal attacks and vulgarity directly directed towards me as an individual to share those concerns regarding our attendance homes. I have not been able to respond individually, but I plan to do so in the coming days. In the meantime, I hope that this statement makes clear my rationale for supporting the changes before us. Thanks, Rathina. Other comments, questions, points for discussion? Sure. Sir, sure can. Okay. Um, and first off, Rathina, um, it was very heartfelt, and I, excuse me, uh, it was very heartfelt and uh, emotional, and I appreciate your passion and 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 uh, being in in uh, this discussion, and and uh, they're not easy. And uh, uh, Lori and I were on. Uh, another one when it got uh, contentious and uh, we lost uh, a board member because of it. And uh, I don't want that to happen. And uh, the board member we lost I thought was uh, one of the best ones that we served with and uh, had 33 years of uh, educational experience in our school district and uh, it was a tremendous loss. Um, I just wanted to go to, uh, uh, well, and, and, and to what you're, what you're talking about, there's some questions that I have, and, and uh, um, I didn't prepare a formal statement. I had difficulty with, with this whole thing. Uh, I rode the Alexander bus uh, with the students on Tuesday of uh, last week uh, because that was a decision I had, uh, I voted against. Um, and uh, wanted to experience the ride with those students to uh, Northwest. And uh, uh, I, I encourage all of us uh, to take the time to ride bus 25 and uh, uh, see where it starts and where it ends and, and what those students go through every day. Um, on the map, Steve, if you could go to... Uh, Let's see, I'll try and do this in order. To Longfellow, uh, the Walnuts, uh, there is a, a family, uh, there's uh, some families there that uh, uh, Walnut Street, uh, that area, which is north of Kirkwood, that is going to uh, Twain. It's right here. Yeah. yeah, a small group of small group of families. Do you know exactly how many uh, are, are because in in my conversations with it, it's it's just a handful of uh, parents that are saying that you know that there's a first grader, a fourth grader that are going to be moved out and there's no other uh, students going with them. I don't know those numbers, uh, but uh, the area you're looking at is right here and the, the families would be indicated by the dots on the map. Right, so how many dots do we have? A dozen. Is it that many? Okay. Um, and the concerns raised there was, is okay, they're going across uh, Kirkwood as opposed to staying on 
the, the north side of, of Kirkwood not having to cross and go that way. And, and uh, uh, I did, uh, when I first got on the board, walked with those families because they, they've kind of been in this situation before being challenged, moved around. What's, what's the rationale and why are we? That was what? done back in 1516. Uh, that wasn't part of this current round. Mm -hmm. Well, is it, is it a time we can, uh, is, 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 this, is this something that's a, at all on the radar to correct at this point? We haven't well, discussed it. I'd the motion on the floor is to approve the maps as presented. Okay. Um, I know we're on we're on the maps, but uh, the uh, the issues brought up about dividing families up and everything. I'm I'm with 100 percent. I think families should should have uh, stability in their lives and and. Uh, we jumped to the consent agenda in which uh, today alone uh, $248,000 are going to the districts of uh, Lone Tree and Mid Prairie for students who are leaving our district to go elsewhere for a multitude of reasons. But I think some of the reasons are is because we don't provide stability to our community. And uh, sometimes we need to just leave these things alone. We have to set them. If, if there's a new school that opens, then we have to get into it. Um, I understand you know, where we're going on our goals and things like that, but as, as community members have brought up, um, we don't really seriously address the numbers. And there's a lot of discussions uh, and, and issues that affect student performance as well as far as uh, climate, curriculum, parental uh, parent uh, engagement. And I think those are just as important, and those are discussions we haven't been having. And, uh, uh, you know, we need to focus on that uh, that way. Um, uh, the transportation costs, we've, we haven't gotten any uh, feedback from the administration on where we are with transportation costs with these changes. Do you, can you comment on that? Ballpark, uh, Craig and I and the Transportation Department took a look. Uh, and again, not having Durham uh, run the routes for us, um, it looks like we're going to be able to reduce a few routes out of this. Um, so there is uh, an opportunity to save some busing uh, costs with the model that's on the table right now. So we're going to save, it's, it's going to be a economic gain. Yes. Is what you're saying. We're not going to have any more costs. No, in transportation appears, because of these moves. It appears to be a reduction in routes right now. And also, uh, what, 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 if any, effect will this have on secondary uh, numbers and balance and, and uh, demographics with, with these changes? I've got Adam running those uh, numbers right now, so we'll get those to you as soon as we have those. So we, we can't answer that question before the vote? Uh, I don't have that uh, analysis done for you, no. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Let me go ahead. I want to thank our community, first and foremost, for being a part of this process. Um, as you are probably aware, because we've all said it several times, um, these are difficult decisions for the board, and um, we've spent an awful lot of time talking about them. And um, sometimes I, I think the board works on things for a long time, and it doesn't, um, the community doesn't become aware of um, some of the details until the end. And um, I appreciate that you've engaged in the process, and I know that some of you are unhappy with what we have, um, but I do appreciate you speaking up and, and engaging and um, letting us know what we need to know. Like Ruthina, I've also written down some comments and I had some technological issues at home so I'm gonna read them off my phone, apologize for that. Personally, I've spent a great deal of time considering these boundaries, um, I've spent many hours thinking about them, thinking about how they could be better, thinking about what we could do different, um, received tremendous number of emails. I know we all have um, spent a lot of time reading those and um, I've spent a lot of time having conversations with some of you all and uh, many community members on um, this difficult decision. And frankly, the truth of the matter is that I, I'm conflicted. Um, th th 
this is difficult. Um, what we're doing is, is a big change for this district and, um, and, and it's hard. It's hard for us and I don't equate what we're doing with what you all um, have shared with us, but um, it's, it's not easy. When um, a few months ago, actually it's probably been eight or nine months ago now, um, our board went through an exercise where we listed our top priorities. Um, there's, a, a, there's a document that we have um, in our policies called Appendix 5, Factors for School Facilities Planning, and there's 21 factors that we weigh as we make these decisions. And that's an awful lot, and many of them are in conflict with each other. So we went through an exercise as a board to uh, pick out our top five um, and uh, kind of put them in order of priority. And um, I will say that one of my top priorities um, when I did that was to minimize disruptions. Um, and by minimizing disruptions, I'm meaning multiple boundary changes within short succession. I'm not referring to pairing schools as being um, a disruption um, when I refer to that. Since the boundaries have to change in 2019 because we're closing a school and we're opening two other schools, for me, this is the time we need to make a change to minimize disruptions. We need to do this now because we're already making a change and if we wait, we will be causing a second wave of disruptions. However, that has meant that we've had to make some decisions with a very tight time frame. And that has led to a final product that, if it were up to me, would look different. There would be some changes. I do feel, though, that this set of boundaries does bring about some very significant change in some places of the district, though I recognize it does not bring enough change. And specifically, uh, where I struggle is in our highest and our schools that have the highest percentage of students that are on free and reduced, free or reduced lunch, and our schools that are, have the lowest percentage. And I've said this before, and I really believe it in my heart, that both high and low extremes are important for the board to address. That said, to my knowledge, this set of boundaries is the most comprehensive district-wide elementary boundary change that this district has made since our elementary schools have become so massively divergent, much of which came about after the No Child Left Behind legislation. Our board in 2016 um, made, had a plan for 2019 boundaries, and I actually voted against that plan um, for um, some of the reasons that I won't go into, but this plan addresses some of the issues I had with that plan, so I will be voting in favor of this plan. I will say that multiple past boards have gotten to this very point with final maps. Sometimes there's been multiple maps, you know, A through F iterations, many, many, many options, and Past boards, no, no uh, disrespect meant to them, but for various reasons, they have walked away and they've not made district-wide, comprehensive elementary boundary changes. That is what we are doing tonight, and I think it's a historic moment for us. And, and um, while it's, it's not the right out, or it's, it's an outcome that not everybody's happy with, I do think it's, it's um, something we need to do. Despite that the set of boundaries is not perfect, I do think, as I said, that it is a big improvement. And I do um, hope that this board and future boards <coughs> will continue to work to make progress with um, all of our schools, but particularly those that are at the extreme on each end. The, highest, the students with the highest percentage of free or reduced lunch and the schools with the lowest. Um, I do think that both need to be addressed. Um, I, I recognize that um, some people will be saying to us in a few years, um, show us the numbers, show us whether this was successful or not. Success is not for me um, going to be something that I can judge by numbers. 
what we're looking at is making climate and culture changes. We're looking at integration. This is a very significant um, type of change that we're making. Yes, we do hope to see academic improvement as well, but that is not the only measure of whether this will be successful or not. We ultimately, as a board, um, and our administration and all of our teachers and all of our staff in the district are working to prepare our students to be citizens in a global society and we want them to be successful. I believe that this plan does make progress towards that. Thanks again for being here tonight and for participating in the process. Going down the line, um, like my colleagues, I've also got a few prepared remarks. Um, I first want to thank the board, the administrative team, teachers, principals, and especially all of the community members who are here tonight, but who've also participated throughout our process, attending work sessions, coming to listening posts, sending us emails, phone calls. Uh, I appreciate all of your engagement, energy, and your passion, because I know in all of your hearts, you want our district to be successful, and you want every student in this district to be successful. Um, I also want to do a special shout out to the administrative team because I know you've put in super long hours preparing data, charts, maps, um, bringing forward every option that the board has asked to see, and I know that those have been long days and nights um, preparing the information. Um, I think this, personally, for me, is a very strong, and I would even echo uh, Lori's remarks, a historic step forward in, in our goal that has been a goal of our district for some years now around providing equitable learning environments for all of our students. Um, we're providing better balancing around socioeconomic status at our elementaries, but we're also relieving some con capacity concerns in some of our higher poverty schools, and I think those two things and combinations are making significant improvements uh, at our elementaries. I'm also going to acknowledge, like my colleagues have, that this plan uh, does not go nearly far enough. Um, we have a tremendous amount of work to do in this district to keep up this work. Um, Phil mentioned climate, Lori mentioned climate, Ruthina hit on climate. If all we do is move students from school to school and do not focus on climate uh, and how students feel, the uh, cultural responsiveness that we have in our schools, that we have teachers um, um, ready and responsive and administrators and building staff, everyone ready to serve students as they come to us. If we don't address those things, we will not be successful if all we do is move students from building to building. Um, so those uh, initiatives around climate, whether it's continuing to focus on our climate survey, whether it's continuing to focus on uh, uh, things like implicit bias training, whether it's things like bringing AVID pro programming into the schools, all those kinds of things working together along with these physical changes in our buildings are going to be what helps us. But it's, it's still not going to be enough and it's going to be uh, a continued effort, um, not just from parents, uh, not just from teachers, not just from board members, not just from uh, administrative staff. It's going to be our entire community that needs to rally around this goal about having every one of our students have an equitable experience in the classroom. Um, we're going to have to, as a community, have this in our hearts and minds as a goal, and we're going to have to work together to make it happen and accept the change when it comes because we have to change. Personally, as a board member, I am not willing to kick the can down the road anymore and accept status quo where we've got too many students who are so silently falling through the cracks. We're not paying attention, and I cannot, as a board member, sit here and not make a change. Um, and so I understand that it's not perfect. I understand that it's going to um, make some families unhappy. Um, I understand that uh, change is very, very hard, but I also understand that we are doing a disservice right now to many of our students in our schools, and I can't, um, I can't live with that. I think we need to move forward. I think this proposed set of boundary changes has moved us in the right direction, um, but I also will say, uh, as long as I'm on this board, this is one vote, and we're going to continue to commit our energy, time, and resources to doing all those other things around climate, uh, et cetera, to make our schools as successful as they can be in support of every single student in this district. And I'll pass it over to Paul. Uh, I also want to start out by thanking the uh, community for being very involved in this process, as well as the administration team. As Janet said, they put in a lot of hours uh, due to this um, process. I also want to thank the teachers um, and, the, and the principals who I talked to and who gave us feedback all throughout this year and my time on the board, even before my time on the board, about why we needed to make some change. And I'm confident that the admin team will work with the um, staff at the schools to make this transition as smooth as possible uh, for all families involved. Um, 
The decision tonight is not an instant fix that some were hoping for, for. In fact, this decision tonight is just one of many steps along the way to our end goal. Uh, I love history. It's my favorite subject. So I just want to run through a little bit of history to, to show you that this isn't one vote that we're doing. It's a series of votes that have um, taken place in the, in the past. So back in 2013, the school board passed a 10-year facility master plan that was designed to touch and update every school across the district with the goal of giving everyone in the district an equitable learning space, physical learning space. In 2015, they implemented RAM, uh, which was designed to give the resources to schools that needed it the most. It's not a sustainable model, especially with the way that our government is funding our schools. We know that we can't uh, sustain that, so we need to make some changes there as well. In 2016, I was on the school board when we passed the secondary boundaries, that was that work to balance the secondary schools. At that time, uh, the elementary boundaries had already been passed, and they, it did not uh, uh, go as far as we had, li had hoped as we had done in the secondary boundaries. And I think that's what this vote today ad addresses. Um, knowing two th in 2019 that two new schools were opening and one school was closing, as Lori said, it was um, something that we knew was going to happen, and this was the time to do it. I would have preferred it to happen earlier in this year, but we took a long process to get to where we're at, and I think we did a good job of, of uh, going through the whole thing. In 2017, the community unanimously voted to pass the bond to fund and finish the construction of this, that was laid out in, in the 10-year th facility master plan in 2013. Earlier this year, 2018, we passed changes to the voluntary transfer policy to further this work. Tonight we take the next step, but it's not the last step towards this goal. After today, we can look at other things like magnet schools, paired schools, or whatever it is that we're not looking at already uh, to try and help the schools, as Lori said, on either end of the, the spectrum there. I've heard a lot of comments throughout this process, people telling me that we were just trying to make the numbers look good. I can tell you my decision is not about numbers. When you say numbers, I see kids, kids that deserve us working to provide positive educational real outcomes through equitable learning environments, regardless of where they live. I've also heard from many families that we should not move their kids for numerous reasons, but at the same time, they suggest that we move other kids. Those other students may also have the same reasons for not wanting to, to move, but in the end, I think the kids are, are adapt to change a lot better than, we, than the parents do. I think the kids will be okay. Let's talk about that last part. Let's talk about where they, where they live. Many have said they purposely bought a house so their kid could go to the school at a certain school. In reality though, you bought a house in this community because the schools, the teachers, the staff, the community is dedicated to giving your child a high quality education regardless of the school. What we tell families, what do we do for families that don't have the luxury of buying a house anywhere in the district? Some families, they don't get to make that choice. The choice is made for them due to where they can afford housing. Finally, I want to address something that was emailed, me to, to, emailed to me today. The question that was asked of me was, quote, how might you balance the percentage of low SES and percentage of ELL burden across the district, end quote? Let me just make one thing clear. Children of poverty and children who do not speak English as their primary language are not, and I repeat, they are not a burden. They're in fact children who deserve to be treated just like every other child. Children of poverty and ELL students, again, are not a problem. They are kids just like your own that can su succeed if we give them the tools and the environment to succeed. Diversity is in fact one of America's greatest strengths. People from all over this world came to this country for a better life to succeed, to thrive, and to have successful families. Our district should also embrace and welcome that diversity in each of our schools. The diversity of the Iowa City Community School District is one of the greatest strengths we have. I'm voting yes to educational, op e equitable educational opportunities because I owe it to the kids in this community. If this is a historic moment, as Janet and Lori have said, I feel my vote in favor of it will ensure that I was on the right side of history. I did not prepare a statement, and I feel, well, I, I wing it better than I prepare, so I'm going to wing it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about perspective and really my perspective and how it's, it's changed over time. Um, 
Many years ago, I had two children at one elementary school, and we were very happy there. My young kids loved it. Um, I got involved immediately with the uh, PTO group and ran the fun fair and thought it was awesome. And then we were told that the district was building a new elementary school and we were going to move. And I couldn't imagine doing that. We had struggled trying to get into the BASP program at the original school. We gave up on that and found an in-home daycare that was in the neighborhood right next to the elementary school and all the kids walked together from that school or from that house to the school. And we were concerned greatly about what were we going to do at a new school with maybe not having BASP. Um, at the time uh, we were told they were moving, there wasn't a BASP program in place. Um, and they finally decided there was one. And I got up at, I think, 3 or 4 in the morning and went and got in line uh, to get my kid into that new BASP program. And when I finally got to the front, I was the first one on the waiting list. I didn't even get in. And I tell you, that is very real angst. Um, we were nervous. Both my, you know, my wife and I worked. We leave pretty early in the morning. And we didn't know what we were going to do. Fortunately, we got lucky and they expanded the BASP program and my kids got in and that made a world of difference. I will admit that we were lucky there. Um, going, looking back on that, I jumped into the PTO there and was the treasurer and stayed the treasurer there for the next seven years until my kids were no longer in elementary school. And I can't imagine not having my kids go to that new school. Um, it was a great school, as are all of our schools. And I think that's the perspective that I gained from that decision. And I want to give you another personal story as to how I really changed my perspective. Um, I ran for the board in 2015 and was not elected, not even close. Um, but at the time, I was one of those folks that said, why don't we just put the resources in the schools and not try and do any sort of balancing? It was not a thing that was on my radar. I didn't think it was possible. <laughs> I didn't think it was worth it to move kids around, and I felt like we could obviously just throw more resources at it. And I'm overstating it, but that was my perspective. And a year ago, maybe even over a year ago, shortly after I was elected, um, we had several um, listening posts with uh, staff and uh, parents and uh, community members at some of our highest need schools. And it became abundantly clear that the environments that kids were learning in and our staff was teaching in were not the same. Were not the same everywhere. And some of them were very, very difficult compared to others. And they're all different. I mean, every school has its challenges and you know, any staff uh, member will tell you that. But it was just very difficult over you know, across the board. And that's when we started this conversation of needing to do something. And this whole time we have been very diligent about balancing the need for immediate action versus preparing for long-term sustainability with our changes. And I, I think that's where my perspective is now that we are finally, finally, in Iowa City, one of the most progressive places in the state, taking a step towards integration. <coughs> it was not done previously. I know I've had numerous emails where people say, we're changing boundaries all the time. And that is not true. It did only happen when schools were open. And it's still only happening when schools are open this year, I will add. Um, it's never had this targeted approach towards integration and balancing demographics at our school. And I'm not going to repeat everything that everybody else said. We know that it's not the final step. Um, we, have, we started the conversation taking other approaches, looking at paired schools and things like that, um, knowing that that was a long-term solution. 
um, to go along with it, we wanted to be prepared for some of those long-term decisions and changes that we will make to further our goal. Um, and some of those things had to do with maybe some boundaries would look better earlier if we were getting ready to pair them later. And that kind of took a secondary uh, uh, approach there, but one of the biggest steps that we took was re um, restricting voluntary transfer. You know, it is very difficult to do any of this work if you don't know where kids are gonna be, you know, year to year to year, right? If they're moving around, it, our lines here are meaningless. So that was a very big, uh, firm step that we took. Um, and because of that, it's created um, some other issues. And as you know, we talked about trying to balance the, the FRL numbers and uh, balance by race and all these other things. But one of the things that we has really come to a head is the uh, capacity at our schools um, is just not going to work if we do nothing right now. Um, I would point to, to Kirkwood as the prime example. It looks pretty good if you look at uh, the numbers after they get their addition, but it, it really doesn't look good next year if you don't do anything. Um, they'd be well over their capacity um, next year. And so kids need to move because of that. And the fact that we are opening two schools. So there are all of these moving parts and it is far from a perfect solution. Um, what I feel we are faced with tonight are essentially three choices. One is that we take no action on our boundaries, and that's going to leave very significant issues, at, like at Kirkwood, for example, and many other schools. The other option, or a second option, is to prove them as they're presented. Um, knowing that it doesn't go far enough to meet our goals, um, but it does take steps in that direction. And the third option is trying to move some stuff around, and I even got some numbers here, and as I was trying to move some of the areas around that uh, folks have talked about um, from one to another, and then you gotta move another one, and you gotta move another one, and it's kind of seeing how that wheel spins, and I think probably if given enough time, we could come up with something better. Um, but we will never come up with something perfect. Um, so the question is, how far can you push this before you just can't take any action? Because that's my fear now, is if we start trying to move those pieces around the table again and around the wheel, we would not be able to make a decision to have it implemented in 2019. And then we're back to my first uh, proposal, is that we do nothing. And I'm just not willing to accept that at this point. I think that there are very real short-term pains that people are gonna feel. And I, I feel it, I really do. Um, I have a hard time going to sleep at night as I think about this stuff and how it affects everyone because I know how it affected me. Um, the one thing that I think a couple of folks had made the comments of does the gain outweigh the pain? Um, and that is something that I think we have been weighing throughout the whole process. And I think that what's really hard is to figure out where is the gain happening versus the pain happening, because it's not all in the same place. And, I, I, and that's where we have to take that step back up here and look at it as a whole and say, we're getting some gains here and it's causing pains here. And it, that feels terrible doing that, right? Because you're picking somebody over somebody, but no matter what we do, we're picking somebody over somebody, right? Because I sat here and looked at one development that folks are talking about, okay, don't send them to Horn, send them to Weber. Well, then Weber's too big, so then we kick the Weber people out to, right? You're playing off each other, and I don't want you to have to do that, and we don't want to have to do that either, right? It's, it's, not, it's not something that we're enjoying, but I, much like uh, some of our other comments here, I feel that while it is definitely not perfect, it is good. It is better than where we're at now, and it's better than where we will be next year if we don't do anything. Um, so I think it's a, it's a necessary step, and I will be voting in favor of it. Um. <clears throat> I guess I'm winging it too. Um, I really uh, appreciate all the comments by my board members, you know, Ruthina. Um, I feel pretty, yeah, 
brings up a lot of problems for me that you've had some personal attacks. Um, I hate to say I'm not surprised. Um, I will say that I was involved in this process in 09 and 10, and I saw less of that than I did back then. Some of the um, comments uh, Paul referred to um, were a lot more loud and a lot more frequent. And I have to say I appreciate the community this time around that uh, there have been, in my experience, a lot less of that sort of um, just straight up racism. Um, and so I hopefully that says something about um, where we're headed. Um, having said that, you know, this should have been done then. This should have been done 10 years ago. We knew the problem was there. And the easiest thing to do to support segregation is nothing because it just happens. And nobody's intending to do it. Nobody comes in buying a house saying, I want to live in a segregated neighborhood. But it's the way the system works if we don't take action. And so I don't blame previous boards because <coughs> this is what always happens is equity, when we talk in our meetings and we put it up publicly, equity is so important. And when it comes down to it, um, the status quo just doesn't want to change for good reasons. You don't want your kid to move school. Um, I understand that. I mean, my personal experience is I've had kids that went to five different elementary schools, you know, Twain, Weber, Lincoln, um, Kirkwood, and Mann, uh, and they did great. By the time my daughter graduates high school, I would have had a child attend City High, Tate High, and Liberty High, uh, and they're all great. And so I don't have a lot of angst about switching schools because my personal experience is that my own children did it over and over again. Now, frankly, why did we do it? We were in poverty. And we weren't thinking about what school we went to, we were thinking about how to pay the rent. And, and I think that while some families are going to feel some pain, most of the pain is being felt by families who don't speak up, who don't get to, who don't know how to, who don't have the means to. And they go along silently and we see what happens, everything from poor achievement gaps to the school to prison pipeline. And that supports all of that. And all we have to do is just nothing. And so, um, as far as the disruption goes, I mean, Sean's right, you know, we do, we have only made these changes when we open schools. But the other thing about some of these policies is we have had a history of school boards that have been deeply split, deeply divided, and then elections where a new majority is elected and it's a 180 turn. And so we've had an admin that doesn't know how to do something or isn't able, frankly, to do something consistently with continuity because they get a new board in and now all this work gets thrown out the window and it's, it's a new sheriff in town. So I hope, and I know it's something I, I campaigned on along with uh, my fellow board members who campaigned uh, and won that election, that we were gonna commit to a better working relationship on the board. That that was going to be very, very important. And I think what you're gonna see tonight and what you've been seeing is you've seen unanimous votes on very contentious topics. In the past, that never happened. It was 4-3 with very deep divisions and a lot of acrimony, and then elections that happened from that. My hope is moving forward, I think this board, by just tweaking these boundaries, we said, even though we didn't fully agree with what that previous board did, we are gonna honor their work, and we're gonna continue forward. In addition, this boundary, um, and I know for some families, this is gonna be the biggest thing, for the work that we're doing, this is the smallest thing that we're doing. It is our climate, it is our culture, but those things are going to take years and decades, and we can't wait. Kids can't wait. The kids who are in the schools that, you know, are vastly inequitable, and I think the truth is probably most people are very aware of what goes on in their school, and they don't understand that some of our schools look like they are in completely different communities, completely different districts, completely different states. And it's just not fair. Um, and to me, fairness plays a, a very big role in it. And, I, and we do have to make um, a hard choice. I'd rather make a hard choice now than to keep doing this every single year and come back to it and now how are we gonna make this tweak and now how are we gonna make this tweak. I think if we, if we do this all at once, and I frankly think we can tweak a few things, move roads here and there, but as far as you know, big changes moving, um, a pen or a shimmick, uh, or an Alexander or a Wood, boundary changes aren't really going to get us there unless we're going to commit to bus kids very far. And that's something this board has consistently and previous boards have said, we're not willing to be a district that buses or can't afford to be a district that buses kids very, very far distance in elementary school. Um, 
And so without that sort of gerrymandering and picking out lots of different islands, I don't know that we can move too much further because we do live in a very segregated community. It, it, we have economic segregation. You know, if you go up into North Liberty, you're not going to find a lot of diversity. You're not a lot of economic diversity. There's not a lot of places to move. And so we're somewhat stuck there. Now, will that change over the next 10 years, 20 years? Of course. Developments will come up. Um, different things will happen. And, and as we move forward, that may necessitate more boundary changes. I am sensitive to people who just did this two years ago. I mean, that I think is something that I think that we've tried to solve with our voluntary transfer policy because, you know, that is something people who made the right choice to say, we're going to go with the district, and then the district comes back and says, now we're going to move you again. That I deeply feel for those folks. I think that's a pretty um, sticky situation. As far as extending that to younger siblings, so that would mean, you know, you could have a situation where if somebody's in the next seven years has a new child born. They will also be grandfathered in. And that could just continue um, for a long time and, and not work to further our goal. Um, and I would, you know, I do want to say to the woman uh, who spoke about keeping kids at least in the same class, I think that's something I hope our principals will be mindful of as we assign those kids to classes to be aware of who's moving from what school and, and can we support them in that way. And that is the other thing, to make sure we're communicating with our principals. We have supportive staff in every school and we want to do our best. Some of our schools are going to be different places next year. The changes at Longfellow, um, the teachers who are going into New Hoover, who just have never really dealt with certain student populations, those are going to be really big changes. And, and I'm hopeful and want to keep up my eye on the ball that we continue to support those staff. This is part of the urgency of why we're doing this now, why we're voting in November, because if we wait till April, now, you know, as many people are here tonight, believe me, there's a whole lot of people who don't, still don't know <coughs> this is going on. And they won't know this is going on until they get the letter telling them where their kid goes. We, we got emails today saying, please don't make this change on changes that happened two years ago. So some people just aren't tuned in, and I understand that, that but they will continue to be. And so we need uh, as much time as possible on our end for our admin to notify people. The last time this happened, we did it way too late, and people weren't notified, and that was not fair. So even though the change is, is going to sting for some people, um, we want to make sure to to make that as doable as possible just by getting the communication out and trying to improve on that. Um, so that's you know where I'm come from. It's my perspective. I understand not everybody has that. Um, I think I know we have great schools everywhere. I would argue every single one of our schools is a fantastic place. Um, the problem isn't kids in poverty. The problem isn't kids who are learning English. The problem isn't special ed kids. The problem is when these things are so concentrated it becomes the dominant culture of your school and it creates a, just a different learning environment and it is harder to get the things done. It is harder to teach those kids who can't read to read when there are just too many of them who can't read in one building. And resources don't do it. Um, by the way, as far as resources go with the RAM model, we get rid of every single RAM 2 school with this plan. Every one. That category goes away because none of our schools are going to be, all of them will either be the, the highest level of RAM in the 70 percent, but none of them over 50. So we've, it, it, and again, when we look at those percentages, I know some of those, my daughter goes to Kirkwood, boy, it's from 80 right now to 70, maybe that doesn't seem like a lot. One, that is a huge drop, and the, the bigger drop is the right sizing. Just having the right number of kids, that is going to let the teachers and staff in that building do what they need to do. Rather than just constantly be putting out fires and reacting, there's going to be a lot more proactive work. And so it's one step. Uh, I am sorry for the folks who are going to feel the pain. Some, uh, I think when I ran, you know, Paul and I, we ran um, on opposite sides of a similar issue. Um, and somebody said to me, you know, somebody ox always gets gored. And I hated that. I hated hearing that, but as you look at this and you say, well, yeah, if I do what this person wants me to do and move these folks, these folks suffer, and if we do here, these folks suffer. And ultimately, I will admit, um, you know, I've, I've seen it on the ground in our schools about what happens to kids who fall through the cracks at the secondary level when it's almost always too late to bring them back. Um, I've said it before that unfortunately m I see m more of my former students in mugshots than in graduation pictures. And so I'm 
I'm not willing to let that happen. And I know those folks aren't going to come up here and they're not going to send us emails, but that is what's in the back of my mind, that we live in a system where some people constantly feel the pain. They're constantly um, getting the, the lesser of the deal. And, and this is a beginning of what we can do, along with all this other work that we're continuing to do with our comprehensive equity plan, hiring staff of color, um, all this other work. This is kind of the first pretty brave step um, that boards previously haven't been willing to take. Um, and so I really do appreciate all the input from everyone. I appreciate all the support people have said, even if they don't like exactly what we're doing, they appreciate why we're doing it, and they understand that, and I think we've heard that over and over again. And so for all of those reasons, I'm gonna vote in favor of this tonight. I just had a couple, if I could, just a couple of things, and I, uh, uh, I'm encouraged and I will hold uh, my fellow board members accountable for their statements tonight about their commitment to uh, uh, curriculum and uh, climate and those types of things because we need to address it and we need to get on top of that. Um, also, the, the history lesson on the FMP, uh, we should also remember the school that was left out, Hills, is the highest, with our changes, is going to be the highest uh, uh, socioeconomic status uh, stool, school in our district and that we have an opportunity to address that. Um, our priorities with uh, much of our FMP spending was put on sports, which sports equity is the last thing we should be worrying about. Um, I'm, uh, um, you know, when we're dealing with, and, and, and uh, uh, JP very well, you know, the, the poverty politics we have in our community, we didn't create, but we're, le we're left with the challenge of trying to solve the problem. And unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, a scalpel, we got a sledgehammer, or buses and diesel fuel. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult challenge, and I hope that we, we raise questions when things come before us, what goes up around our schools. We're dealing with the two most important decisions any family ever has to deal with, and that's the education of their kids and the most expensive investment they make in the purchase of their house. And many, like, like you say, JP, it's, it's, it's where the, really the decision is, is you want to live in the community and you're limited with where you can be. Um, and uh, I, I share the concerns of, of others that have said that, you know, we, we wish we could have gone further. I think we had some opportunities and uh, that, but, uh, um, uh, and, and, I, and again, I, I'm, I'm uh, concerned that uh, we have uh, always addressed the loudest and the most, uh, the most affluent voices, and many times other voices are silent or not heard or not responded to. Thank you all for your comments tonight, thoughtful consideration, and again, thank you to community members, administration, teachers, staff, principals, everyone who's engaged with us along this journey. Um, if there's no further comments, I think um, we will turn to a vote. We've got a motion and a second on the table. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, directors. Um, next up is the voluntary transfer policy. Um, I think that the vote that we just took um, made some modifications. Steve, help me with that. Uh, yes, if you look at the uh, draft that's uh, in your packet, uh, you'll note that there's an area that's highlighted in yellow. Uh, this is part of the uh, process that was passed by the board uh, earlier this fall. You'll note that it uh, uh, include students in the Van Allen attendance area that were zoned to Wickham. Those students have now been zoned back to Van Allen, making that particular clause irrelevant. Um, so if the board would wish to entertain a motion on this tonight, um, you would want to do so uh, excluding the highlighted language in yellow. I move that we approve the full terror transfer policy with the uh, highlighted language excluded. I second. Any further conversation or comments? Well, yeah. Um, 
and I know uh, at the work session, which uh, not everyone was at, uh, there was a discussion on, you know, how long is the grandfathering going? And uh, I know at that time, at that discussion, I was kind of thinking of one mind, but after uh, looking at it, I don't know that the numbers of ex giving families or households that exception is going to be that significant to throw things off. What are your feelings on that, Steve? If we were to have a family or a uh, uh, household uh, language in the voluntary transfer so we wouldn't have instances that were explained by families that their one kids will age out in the same school but yet they could have another child that then is going to go to a different school. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know how we'd predict it. If it's based on a family, you could have a kindergartner now. They could have a child 10 years from now who would still be eligible for that. So I, I don't know how we would quantify that. Steve, a question that I have is, um, and I'm not asking for this to be written into policy, but we're talking a handful of families here. We, they could be identified at this point. Um, so they, they could be on the, you know, you have a list of them. These are these families. Would it be possible for the administration to keep those names and as they review the voluntary transfer forms, consider the situation of those families? And, and I recognize, first of all, you need to obviously follow our policies, but I do know that you have some discretion as well um, I know you don't like gray areas, you like it black and white, um, but, but we're really just talking, you know, a handful. Um, I, I don't know how many, but I, I would guess it to be less than five families. In which geographic area? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm referring to the children that have had, the families that have had a move from Weber, from Horn to Weber, and now back to Horn. I'm not referring to families that did not have a change from Horn to Weber. So any families that moved into Weber, or what is now Weber, but live in that area that's now going to Horn would not be part of that group because those families did not experience a change. Any families that had a kindergartner that started at Weber did not have any children that changed from Horn would not be included in that group. These would only be families that had children that changed. Now they're making another change. I, I feel that, that making a change within two years is especially when there are other families that chose not to make this change and their voluntary transfer requests were approved by our policy at that time. Um, these folks followed what the district set forth for them. We could put a database together like that. I don't know how many kids it is, but we can do that. Could, could there be some discretion, though, as you review those, free, as you have that list? Um, it, it wouldn't change over time because it's, you know, unless they move, they'd be taken off the list. We'd have to uh, amend the voluntary transfer process as it's written right now because there actually isn't latitude to move them into Horn under the rules we have. So we'd have to write an exception for that. But we could, we could tell you how many students that would affect. So you would, you would want it written into the policy? There, uh, well, you had said to follow the policy, there actually isn't anything in the policy that would allow us to move those younger elementary, prospective elementary kids into Horn uh, or into Weber, uh, at least at this point in time, in terms of where they reside on the side of the equity line. So there isn't actually anything in the policy that would allow that move without us writing an exception in. Okay. Is that exception something that this board would want to codify? So here's, here's where I'm at on that. I don't, you know, I don't want to create a slippery slope. I don't want to create a situation where people say, well, you did that for this family. If it is this narrow group of people who the district chose to move two years ago and is now choosing to move back, who have kids younger, I, you know, they can move, you know, I, I would support that. I mean, I, you know, because it feels to me like 
uh, a government body made a decision, people abided by that, and now the governmental body is punishing them for doing what they wanted them to do and rewarding the people who went against the decision. And that, that is the part. And if that's five people, and we can, you know, because I don't want people to constantly go down the road saying, well, you did it for them, now do it for us again. I, hopefully we don't have a lot of situations where we're moving people every two years. That should be super rare. But I do feel for those people who said, who did the right thing, and now are saying, well, you know, too bad for your four-year-old. Um, and, and again, that number shouldn't change. There's only a certain number of people this has happened to. There's, it's not, um, and frankly, if we did decide to move people two years from now who just moved now, I would feel for those folks too. I, I think that that is too frequent. Um, you know, the Boer log to Weber, I mean, that was in 2011. I don't, that doesn't feel like rapid frequency. Two years mm -hmm. is pretty frequent. Now, again, um, I mean, that's just kind of where I'm at on that. I, I wish we could do that with a discretionary, like, you could just decide to do that. You know who those families are. You can track. And no, I, I think we need to codify it. If we're going to do it, I think we need to. I don't want to have these kind of behind the scenes, super secret rules for certain families that, that uh, it needs to be codified because of this ex uh, frequent uh, move that the board has brought about. Um, I think that we'd want to try to put some language in place to so deal with that. It's 34 students. I don't know how many families that is, but it's 34 students. Um, and those would be students that this year would be in grades two through five um, who moved from uh, Horn to Weber and are now moving back to Horn. And it would only include those that have a younger sibling that is not yet already in born yeah. and not yet in school. Okay. So, I don't, so that would yeah, narrow it down. Right, so yeah. it's 34 students no more than 34 families. Um, so I, like I said, I can at least give you that ballpark so you know what number we're talking about. And the other reason I bring this up is because when we talked about it this in our work session, we talked about how the Scanlon exception was setting a precedent for this. It's, it's actually not because that is a situation where no students have moved. And this is a situation where students have right. physically moved just two years ago. Right. So it, it really is, I think, fair to consider it separately from that. So like, like JP said, I, I would hope that there would not be situations like this again where students are being moved within this short amount of time, not by their own choice. Right. So we have a motion and a second on the table for the voluntary transfer policy as is. If the board is interested in considering different language, um, I would suggest we vote on that existing um, uh, motion. Um, and if we want to add or change language, we should vote against it and then um, move to work session perhaps and work through uh, the language that we want to see. We could also, if, if JP wants to withdraw his motion, he could also do that so we didn't have to vote against the voluntary transfer. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would withdraw my motion. And then whoever had the second would have to withdraw. I withdraw my second. We can bring back proposed language for you on the 11th. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Um, moving on to the next item, which is the program of study, I believe. Okay, that's mine. So you? on a lighter note, right? Um, we have the program of studies that we bring to you each fall. And I included a copy of the high school program of study and the junior high program, as well as a list of the changes um, that you'll find in the program of study. So you'll see on the changes some of the things that um, I assume you had anticipated. You'll see the ethnic studies course in there. Um, AVID that we had talked about as an elective now at the high school, the um, egg course to begin at the high school. You'll also see a new course of Comp 1 and Comp 2, which would be courses that the kids could take at our high school by our teachers and receive college credit, Kirkwood credit for those, um, and then as well as a few changes um, just to some course titles and um, some courses that are being eliminated due to lack of enrollment. The other thing you'll see in the back of the high school program of study are some pathways that we have worked on um, throughout last spring, the summer, and this fall. We've had a joint effort with um, ICR, Iowa, and with Kirkwood Community College, 
and with our own staff to put together pathways based on the 16 career clusters to show students how they could um, start taking coursework in high school and then through um, academies, through certificates, through two-year degrees and through four-year degrees and the different career choices that they might have. Um, trying to open up their eyes to a variety of ways that they can pursue additional education and then what might be some career choices for them. So our intent um, as we worked with this was to develop these pathways and then to share those with um, area school districts so that they could also use them and then just change kind of that bottom piece where they list the high school courses that would be pertinent to their district as well. Um, so we thought we'd include those in the program of study so that that might help kids start thinking about what courses they might want to take depending on what career they might be interested in. Now on the uh, uh, introduction to Ag <coughs> Foods and Natural Resources, are, you, are we going to be utilizing the case curriculum for that? That is our intention, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. super. And on the uh, composition one and two, Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that you're expecting all the students to, to take both because it's a uh, semester course and we're trimester? Right. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily have to, but that would mean that at the second part, like if they just took Comp 1, the course would actually end in December, so they might have an open period for that second part of that second trimester. Right. We don't but, have but typically they would probably end up taking comp one and comp two. Right, and we don't have any half trimester courses uh, Correct. to fill in. Mm -hmm. um, on the computer aided uh, or computer integrated manufacturing, um, I remember Brian Martz kind of explaining that to me and we, uh, he went through some special training. Now does our present teacher have the training necessary to, no, to uh, uh, conduct that course? Yeah, that's not something that I know right now, but I can get that to you. Matt might know. Yeah, to be able to do that course, they'll have to have that Project Lead the Way training uh, to, to be able to offer that class. So yeah, we'll definitely yeah, because be Because I know we invested that. in a lot mm -hmm. of expensive equipment for that. And, yep. and unfortunately, when we lost Brian, we lost the, the training and the, along with that. Right. So we train the, the we register them for the Project Lead the Way courses is usually a on-site training that they need to do and uh, or sorry I said Project Lead the Way but um, with that course yeah we'll get that training set up and that teacher will definitely have that if they don't already. And this course will fall under that umbrella right that Project Lead the Way umbrella. Yeah, it's part of the pathway there. I just wasn't being as specific as the course. Yeah, okay. Not to confuse people. And and on the French five. Do we have any ideas of antis or, or uh, I'll, I'll French and Spanish both? Do we have any uh, anticipated class size or anything that way? Actually, um, that is going to be a change, and because of the change of order of the agenda, um, Carmen Guenegal is here to talk about the World Language Curriculum Review, right. and she'll explain kind of why that change um, is coming about. Okay. Well, I kind of yeah, I, ha I had this prepared for for that. And on the, uh, when we get into uh, some of the art curriculum, like sculpting, I think we're missing a, a big opportunity by not uh, uh, putting welding in there in, in art. Uh, it's a great opportunity for kids to express themselves and, and to uh, work that way and also to get them interested in the trade. And I'd like to see us uh, push to get that in um, with our uh, with our career and uh, our industrial tech courses. Um, you know, so many of them are there's no prerequisite. And I understand you want to get interest in things like that, but there's to me there needs to be a building block of curriculum and that you don't jump into uh, you know, some of these things without taking some basic courses and that should be building block no different than we look at uh, math or English. Uh, if our goal is to teach calculus, we don't go straight to calculus. We, we have a step procedure to get the skills they need to then master the other discipline. Um, I, I guess I'm interested in seeing us uh, 
get those things aligned to where we have building block curriculum and, and we can give students a, a clear path to get some successful outcomes and some skills uh, besides just a, a small sampling. And, uh, you know, I, I see, you know, we're, we're getting some construction technology, architectural planning, ACE introduction, construction skills. You know, I'd like to see that to that ultimately goes to a home building program mm -hmm. and get back to where we were. So um, I think that's, a, that's important for us to do. And, and with your, uh, your piece at the, at the back, with the, uh, and I think that's, that's good, uh, but, you know, I, I think we also need to have um, apprentice information. That's got to be in there. Uh, I know the uh, 1260 carpenters would love to come in and talk with their kids and, and have that presentation or any of the 16 uh, unions that are up in the union facility up in Cedar Rapids um, as far as uh, getting, getting a chance to get before our, our parents and our students to explain the opportunities in, in those areas. So, um, you know, I, 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 I kind of get this, but I'd, I'd also like to see where um, are the curriculum needed to get in these positions. It's, it's a clear, clear, clearer uh, what they should be going into and what they should be taking. Um, just for your information, we do have a career and tech ed um, review committee that just started meeting last week, two weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving. Um, and one of the things that's on their agenda is to look at the apprenticeship programs and see what we can do to strengthen those and to start offering those. And then definitely those would be added to these pathways. Right. Well, and, and we have to be careful with our vocabulary on that, too, because any anything with an apprentice is 18 years or older, sure. so pre-apprentice pre -apprentice. is mm -hmm. what we can do unless we've got a, a, an 18-year-old uh, in our in our school. So that's great, and that's something I've been calling for for a long time uh, is to have those. And I and I really feel every time we have a uh, college night at any of our schools or that discussion, those apprenticeship those uh, uh, trades representatives and those apprenticeships should be presented with just a, with a equal amount of uh, time and uh, opportunity to uh, per, per, uh, to uh, promote uh, those careers. Thank you. Any further comments? I just have a really quick one. I'm sorry, Paul. Right. Sorry. And I'm sorry <laughs> if I steal your comment. Um, I do want to thank the administration. Um, for working hard to get the ethnic studies class that was requested and really promoted by students. As we know, quite a few of them have already graduated, so um, it's unfortunate that they won't be able to benefit from that course, but hopefully they have younger siblings. They will see this, that it will be promoted and hopefully expand it because one trimester is a good start, but I would really love to see that being offered throughout the year. I mean, uh, uh, to, right, absolutely. But I do want to thank the administration as well as the students that you worked with um, to ensure that that was added into the program of study. So thank you. Okay. I just, uh, I have two, you didn't steal what I was going to okay. say. I have two quick questions. Um, one is on <laughs> AVID uh, at the high school level. Um, what? what as far as the application to be accepted, what, I mean, what does that entail? And is it once they are accepted, they're accepted for their entire career, or do they have to reapply every year? Right, so we have a pretty extensive application process that we are developing. Um, part of that includes having kids nominated by teachers, um, having the information presented to the students so they can self-nominate, having an AVID night so we can give information to parents and to students, and then having an application process that looks at ask kids to answer certain questions about their goals and their future, um, looking at kids with a variety of, of different um, indicators, and then judging from that which kids might be most successful for the program. Once they're in the program, yes, they have the ability to continue the program unless, you know, they for some reason aren't meeting the expectations of the program. They might be put on a probation period for a little bit. 
um, but there would be some counseling involved about maybe counseling a student out who no longer maybe fit the program, um, but certainly they would be encouraged to continue all four years. So we're looking at really starting it probably at the freshman level and then next year having two courses, a freshman and a sophomore, and then adding on and adding on until we have one at every level. Okay. And the, uh, the second question I had maybe, I don't know if it's for you or for Matt, um, but in the program of studies for junior high, is there any reason why or why not the CASEL program isn't featured in there? Not, no, not really. I Probably just an oversight. Yeah, it's just building specific, as you know, at this point. And so we kind of allow the building to work through that in their registration process on that. So um, if we do expand it to additional sites, we'd probably include it at that point. I guess I just asked that because there are, I think there are certain things, maybe it's just at the high school level that are only offered at one yeah. school, like it says it in there. And uh, I know people have asked me about it. Um, and just, I was wondering if this would be a place that it should be at or not. Wait, probably because we started as a pilot. Yeah, now it's continued, and we probably just need to move it into there at this point. Yeah. 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 Any further comments, questions? I'll just, um, one comment. I also would echo what we think you said about the ethnic studies course. It's, it's correct in the program of studies, uh, but on your summary, you did spell identity as identify. But um, that's, and, and the other thing, and I'm seeing more of this, you know, relationships 101, but I guess what I've noticed frankly, in my current job is a lot of kids really don't have social emotional skills. And I think sometimes we directly teach those in elementary school and we directly teach those to some of our kids at the high school level who may show extreme deficit. But as we sort of move forward and thinking maybe outside the box a little bit about curriculum, um, I'm finding more and more and more kids just have a hard time uh, going to lunch, uh, being in a busy hallway, knowing how to pick up on social cues, um, have self-awareness, emotional management, that sort of thing. I know there's great curriculum out there um, that we have in the district. School Connect is my favorite that uh, I've used a lot and still do. And so I guess as we move forward, think about this, like adding in a component that would be, um, I mean, I think we cover some of that in health, but I think we cover so much of health in one trimester as a freshman year that some of this stuff doesn't stick with kids. And I think every kid could benefit from um, a deeper understanding of themselves and what role their sort of emotions play out in their, in their daily lives. So I just kind of moving forward would love if we're thinking in those terms about what kind of thing we could offer that, that would try to cover that base a little more deeply um, than just, just the semester of health. But that's all I've got. Yeah, I've, I've got I just one, one quick one I forgot. On the culinary arts, uh, one, two, and three, um, it, it appears it's going to be offered at all our schools. Where exactly will that be uh, in like Liberty and uh, City? Uh, it'll just be in the uh, family consumer science rooms. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, West High kind of adopted that term culinary arts because of some of the equipment remodeling that sure. happened there with the facility redesign. Uh, we're still working with Kirkwood to see if we are, can articulate some of those programs better, but it's it's really just kind of a rename of some of our current courses and with the hopes of future alignment. Okay, super, thank you. Okay, is there a motion to approve the program of studies or are there further comments, questions? I move to approve the program of studies. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you very much. Moving on to the resolution regarding receipt and recommendation of bids and directing the sale of general obligation school bond series 2019. Is there anything to add, Leslie? Um, yes, uh, as the information is presented in your packet, if you remember in September of 2017, the voters approved 191.5 million round number uh, approval for general obligation bonds. We sold the first round uh, last year right about the same time of approximately 56 million. Uh, this is our second of three offerings. Uh, we took the bids today, and I'm gonna turn over that process and the tabulation that explains that to <coughs> Suzanne Gerlach from PFM, who's our financial advisor through this process. All right, good evening. So uh, before the meeting, I handed out um, a, a flyer uh, that says tabulation of bids at the top. 
Um, I'll briefly walk through. Um, first of all, congratulations. Moody's Investor Service affirmed the AAA rating of the district. Uh, you remain the only school district that I'm aware of in the state of Iowa with a AAA rating, the highest credit rating available. Um, the discussion was really good with Moody's. Um, there was a little bit less discussion about the large uh, voter referendum, the, the debt that's going to be issued, um, and a little bit more conversation around the general fund and the opening of the new high school and um, those kind of items. So, um, but it was affirmed and congratulations. And uh, with that, we went into the market today to sell 66,645,000 of general obligation school bonds. Um, we received eight bids from over 42 different firms, so very good turnout. Our goal for competitive sale is three bids. Wow. We got eight, so uh, yeah, very good. Um, with uh, three pages of uh, different groups that wanted to be a part of those eight syndicates that were offering a bid today. Uh, the true interest cost is the measure, kind of the composite APR that we use to measure the, the scale of interest rates that are bid. Um, the TIC, the true interest cost in the all eight bids range from 3.35% to 3.41%. That's only 7.07%. That is really, really, really close together. Um, the first seven bids were within three basis points of each other. And so that tells me there was fierce competition to buy the district's bonds today. Um, the, with the bidding platform that we use is an internet bid platform. So when a bidder submits their bid, they can see if they're the winner or not and they have an opportunity to resubmit. And Leslie, I don't know, every time we refreshed, there was a new lineup of bidders and people were resubmitting. So there was very fierce competition and that meant the lowest interest rate possible for the district today. So we're very pleased. Um, the winning bid came from a syndicate led by JP Morgan Securities, who is one of the premier New York, every time you see New York under um, an underwriting firm, that's one of the premier underwriters. Um, and JP Morgan uh, came in uh, with the winning bid. It, it, in the selling group was Estrada Hinojosa out of San Antonio, Texas, Academy Securities out of New York, New York, and UMB Bank out of Kansas City, Missouri. So a nice mixture of Midwest and um, some of the premier um, underwriters that we see. Um, one other thing that um, this might be the lowest underwriter's discount that I've ever seen. Uh, they only wanted a dollar twelve per bond, which is I think the lowest underwriter's discount I've ever seen, especially on sixty-six million dollars. So um, that meant that they didn't need much of a sales commission, their underwriter's discount, to sell the bonds. That means these are very easy bonds for them to turn around and place with investors. Um, Let's see, uh, the winning bid did come with a premium, a $4.9 million premium that the district is able to keep. Um, the, the bond proceeds all must be used for capital projects, um, so that is nice since I've kind of some of the bids are, are, t are starting to come in a little bit higher, so that'll help pay for the, the master facility plan. Um, and these were structured uh, to maintain a tax rate um, that is within what we told the district, dis the voters uh, that we would maintain for the district. Um, and as Leslie mentioned, uh, the plan is to come back in 2020 and issue the last $65.9 million to do the full voter approved $191 million. So, um, and pricing, I guess the other thing I didn't mention was pricing. Um, the bonds actually priced 10 basis points better than what I had estimated today. So um, just a great day in the market. Congratulations. Um, I told Craig and Leslie that we couldn't have timed it better. Um, interest rates rose pretty significantly uh, late summer, early fall, and we got back about 10 basis points in the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was excellent time to be in the market. So just overall a great day. I'm very pleased with the sale results. Fantastic. Congratulations. Sounds like a fun day, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so is there a motion to approve? Or are there questions? So Moody's is uh, blaming uh, Liberty for, uh, for uh, some concerns. Our third high school. Yeah, but when we went to the uh, uh, Moody credit review, um, it was obvious uh, to Moody's when I projected a $5 million deficit at the end of this year that they needed to be concerned about our spending. And, uh, um, of course, uh, we're going to share with the board in uh, another week uh, a little bit more about that budget and uh, what that looks like into the future. And uh, I was able to walk Moody's through that. Uh, there, uh, um, as far as... Uh, the information that came back to us, 
Uh, they're very comfortable uh, with uh, um, our finances. Uh, there's a, a lot of strengths that they pointed to uh, within uh, the assessment uh, that they made. Um, and one of the things that we have uh, going for us is that um, management, uh, the board and uh, administration as a team has shown um, uh, a, a good deal of responsibility about paying attention uh, to our finances and we've levied the cash reserve we needed to levy in order to maintain cash balances uh, covering our deficits in special ed and other places that we accrue those in ELL and, and so forth and uh, so um, they're very pleased with the management. Our projections have been pretty accurate and, uh, for them. And, and uh, uh, this last year, we were over a little bit as far as uh, at when we ended the end of the year as a little higher deficit. Um, but we were able to explain that with the cost of liberty and so forth that uh, we've talked about before. So uh, they felt comfortable, um, really comfortable with those things. But yeah, it was... Um, uh, and they had every right to uh, to question where we're going to end up this year, and uh, and you know we, we disclosed all of that to them, and yet uh, they felt that there was so much strength within the other aspects of, of what we do that they were able to uh, reaffirm our AAA rating. So. Thank you. And one additional comment I'll make is that when Moody's looks at the fund balance, a one-year deficit isn't something that concerns them. It's, it's an operational deficiency that concerns them. And this is really related to opening a new high school, specifically um, a one-time event. And so um, the economic development, the strength of the community being anchored in Iowa City with the university and the hospital, um, the financial management, all those things that Craig mentioned, are, they felt offset any risk that um, you know, a, a, a short-term deficits would pose and felt comfortable issuing the AAA rating. That's great. Uh, I move that we approve the proceedings and bid recommendation for the sale of general obligation school bonds series 2019. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Uh, next up, resolution to approve application for modified supplemental amounts for increased enrollment. Any comments? Both of the next two items I'll actually comment together and you can take the, the votes individually, but they're both uh, as a result of the certified enrollment process uh, and number of students being served in those respective areas. And so it's a, a normal formal process that happens every time of this year after the certification of the enrollment. Is there a motion to approve um, the first resolution around uh, increased enrollment? Do we have to read the whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I move that we approve uh, the resolution to approve the SBRC application for modified supplemental amount for ELL instruction beyond five years for the 2018. Oh, I'm going to the second one. Sorry. It's okay. Can we keep going with the second one? We'll do that one first, and we'll do the next one. All right. One uh, for the 2018-19 school year in the amount of $380,047. Second. Kim, ready to vote? So that was number six on the agenda there. That was number six. Yeah. Sorry, Kim. The right one up. That's all right. That's the one I had up. Keeping on your toes, Kim. We do apologize for the incredible formality that this requires, but the Department of Education has to see it in the minutes as a its separate line item and it all has to be there and so we just have to throw it out there so online voting is open all votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor so item action item five is there a motion to approve um the uh, for increased enrollment uh, I move we approve the resolution for SBRC application for modified supplemental amount for FY 2019 for increased enrollment in the amount of $590,450. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Now we will uh, move back up to the consent agenda. Phil, do you want to give us an update on bills? Yes. 
Um, uh, we had uh, $1.5 million worth of uh, disbursements this month. That's just down from what we have been. Uh, only 115000 in uh, Go Bond. Um, as I said during our uh, discussion earlier, there was uh, $48,000 worth of uh, general fund money that went to other districts for students that are opting out. Um, uh, there's also um, $21,506 uh, $21, worth of uh, Terracon costs on our playground testing. The playground committee still hasn't received any of those test results. Um, and as I've previously stated, I think we have the opportunity to do a lot of that in-house and save some money, which we should uh, since we're going to be in a tight economic year. I had some questions that uh, I uh, uh, brought up with Craig. Uh, they were all answered. Um, uh, also, one thing that we might want to consider uh, for uh, legislative uh, priority discussion is the uh, cost of document uh, preservation over time because uh, every single record of every student that has ever been in our schools has to be maintained for perpetuity forever, and forever is a long time and an expensive eternity. So uh, that's, that's something at some point in time, uh, uh, but uh, we, we uh, do have a service that uh, is taking old documents and putting them into a format where they can be uh, kept electronically and save us space and give us some increased capacity in our buildings, which is a long-term thing that Craig has over undertaken, and and uh, it's it's something for a discussion at some point in time, but not now. So I, I look through the books; everything is fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say I also um, viewed the bills and I thank you, Phil, for being able to come in like I was on short notice on yesterday, since we had one day to do the review, well, and uh, we got it done. We got but the notice on the 26th. So. Yeah. So, uh, but I also the the one um, one that jumped out at me that I, um, was the document preservation also that Phil talked about, but everything else was fine. Move that we approve the consent agenda. Oh, uh, and and excuse me, I wanted to pull um, nine and ten just for small questions. Okay. So I withdraw my motion, and I now. Move that we approve the consent agenda minus items nine and 10. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Rotland, Ressler, Godwin, Clausen, Malone, and I Stone voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Uh, item nine that's been pulled, voluntary annexation. Right. I'd just like some, uh, you know, we, we were talking about uh, zoning and, and certain things tonight. I'm just curious, do we have any idea what's going in there? Is it going to be mixed-use housing, uh, low-income housing, or is it going to be half-million-dollar homes? <laughs> well, uh, Pat submitted uh, uh, his plan to the city, and I, I thought... Uh, I, I understood it to be single-family dwellings, okay, um, in this location. Uh, he's wanted to develop that for quite a while. If you remember, we re were required to maintain a county strip through there so we didn't create an island uh, for the county. Uh, they're now taking that along the road uh, instead of uh, going uh, uh, through our property at the end, and that will allow the city then to... Uh, uh, annex that triangle for the Scan family so they can develop it uh, into single family homes. So. Did they give you any price range no. or anything? Okay, no, so I, I, we don't we don't know if it's hundred uh, hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand. I don't. I okay. I haven't seen the plan. I just okay. right. appreciate that. Move to move to approve uh, item nine. Second. Kim, ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. 
Appendix 9. Yep, Appendix 9. I'm trying to get to open up. Here we go. Um, yeah, and uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Jeff, but uh, uh, Dwayne left you holding the ball. So um, I'm curious on the grant, the change order, if you can explain the, uh, trying to scroll down to it, uh, the unknown condition of the fill site and uh, a little bit about that change order. When they got up there, they were having um, the, the, the there was a lot more moisture in there, so they they took a lot more out of there. Out, and, out, of, out of what? Um, the soils out, and then they brought in a lot of more rock. I I believe that's part of it, and I'm not 100 percent sure that's all of it. But the soil conditions, I mean, it's, it's just been wet. There was more water up there. And, uh, Fortunately, they didn't get the eight inches of snow we did. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, um, and then also there's a code request to add emergency lighting at an exit. Isn't that uh, code or standard? I mean, how, how did we overlook that one? That would be, I, I, I guess I would have to go and ask the design team. It could be a possibility um, that they changed a room, a layout of the rooms in that. Okay. And uh, everything up there at Grant looking like it's on schedule, I mean, we're we're, we've, we've got a, an open time of, uh, uh, what's the first day of school, Steve? August 23rd. August 23rd, is it gonna be uh, ready to open? Duane and I talked about that again today. And uh, uh, it, we acknowledge that the contractor uh, uh, really struggled with the wet weather um, this summer. Um, we estimate that they're uh, roughly about six weeks behind in their uh, uh, where they wanted to be at this point in time. And um, uh, one of the things that we're considering is that the um, uh, contract was due on uh, July 1 for turning that over to the district. That's when we were supposed to have um, the uh, uh, we were supposed to be able to uh, enter uh, the new building and, and be able to occupy it. We're um, uh, strongly giving consideration to allowing the contractor to have um, July and make that date August 1. Still in time for school, it'll compress the things that we need to do as a district to get the building ready uh, with furnishings and all those kind of things. And so we're gonna have to think through that very carefully. But that'll gain us uh, four of the weeks. Uh, the contractor, uh, um, we're looking at opportunities for them to work through the winter, um, doing some uh, tent enclosures uh, uh, so that we can heat some spaces so they continue working on walls um, and uh, those types of things so that they can stay on schedule. So at this point in time, I'd have to say yes. Um, that uh, we feel that grant is uh, on schedule. Uh, however, uh, November's not being kind to us uh, by any way, shape, or form. Let's face it, it would have been nice if it were, it, it looked more like September it, without the water. But nonetheless, it's not. And so um, they're just, they're working through that and, and uh, we're just uh, going to have to adjust and accommodate. Well, and, and you know, it's, 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 uh, it has, you know, early fall wasn't kind, but I mean, uh, we, they dodged a big bullet with, with having a trace to having eight inches of snow on a job site. Believe me, it, it could be worse. The alternative would always get worse. And uh, this is early in the winter, and uh, I remember the winter of 79 and 80, and uh, uh, we could be in for something like that. Uh, are there any economic uh, ramifications from pushing this thing back? Uh, are, we, are you anticipating any in, increased cost? Uh, we have them locked in, or, or where are we with that? Um, there is a little bit of an increase in cost, and we haven't worked this out with a contractor yet, but we're in discussions with them about um, if, if we allow them to work through the winter with some, some tented areas, that those will have to be heated. And that has not been a part of the original contract, wasn't part of the original contract, and so the cost of the fuel for heating those areas, uh, we're going to have to uh, work that out between the contractor and, and the district, and so we're, we're in the initial stages at, of that discussion now. Any further comments? 
I do have a question about Kirkwood and Tate, but specifically Kirkwood. So we're, uh, it looks like we're approving um, phase four, which is the project design development. Um, and I, I believe I had heard there were some changes at Kirkwood in the plan. Is that what we're approving? Yes, yes you are. Well, yeah, yeah it's, it's, the de it's the design development. So, so just the development? Yes, it's, it's the DD set. It's not the finished set yet. Okay, it says here floor plans, um, formally approving the design is uh, stage is level four on appendix nine. So I just wanna make sure that we see that, that we're not approving that before we actually see it. Yeah, this is still just the design development. We, uh, even our own staff has not gone through them yet. This is just okay, great. the architect. Thank you. I move that we approve the appendix nine requests and project updates. Second. Kim, ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Next up, discussion item on the IASB conference. Four of us attended, Sean, Paul, myself, and Ruthina. Um, do folks want to make some comments about what we learned? Yeah, I'll just be brief. Um, we uh, talk about the sessions that I went to. Um, I went to, to the breakout sessions that I went to were navigating choppy water, social media tips for school districts and board members. I went to one on the flexibility account for school districts, what it is and how to use it. Um, Sean and I both attended typical or troubled addressing mental health issues in your school. And then I also attended one, uh, we, I guess we did together as well. Um, about the overview of the state, uh, new state assessment programs. Um, it was a good, good experience. This is the um, discussions with the UEN um, teams that we had the night before at the banquet were really good, I thought. Um, and it's, it was interesting to me. I sat next to someone from Dubuque and the, she came with a list of questions for us about what we actually just voted on tonight. Um, as they're experiencing the same issues in Dubuque. So I thought that was a very uh, interesting conversation for dinner as we discussed uh, how they were watching us and what we were doing. Um, she also asked me to send her information, which I did on everything that we've talked about. So uh, it was a great chance to meet up with those other districts that are similar to ours and, and have those discussions. I would echo that. I was at a great uh, session on Friday for board presidents, and it was a great opportunity to network with other presidents from other uh, districts, obviously, learn some best practices, um, had a great conversation with the board president and vice president from Ames, and kind of swapped stories about similarities of our communities uh, from a college, active college community. Um, but just an overwhelming theme um, that I heard talking with folks is that um, in, the, in the state, Iowa City School District is highly respected for the work that we're doing on some of the boundary work. Um, I had a number of people come up to me and ask questions around the LGBTQ statement that we made um, uh, in, in support, and they were very impressed with that, um, and uh, basically just asked how in the world we got so much done. And so, I mean, that, that was some of the feedback that I got, and it felt pretty good, actually, um, to have that kind of state perspective. Um, I want to share with other people that didn't attend that we had two board members obtain the Better Boardsmanship Award. So congratulations to Lori and Paul. And Craig actually also received, I think it was the financial award from the association. Steve can help me with the right wording. So congratulations to all three of you for the hard work. Um, I attended uh, a couple of different sessions. One that uh, I actually sat at the table with Harry. He told me to send his regards to everyone. And he actually offered to come down and do that session 
for us. And um, I'm gonna pass this book around. It's one of the handouts we got um, from that. It talks about your real colors. What color are you and how you work um, with different colors to make the decisions that we often uh, have to make as a board with our administration. So it was kind of fun. I was sitting there and Harry was like, so what do you think about your district? And I think I pegged board members as well as administration <laughs> pretty accurate to where we might land. But I'll share that in an email um, as well as uh, the other sessions I attended, just a little tidbit of information. Sorry, my pages are falling out because I actually did the work. <laughs> I'll also be brief. I mean, as uh, Paul mentioned, we had a, a couple of the same uh, talks that overlapped. Um, I think the, the changes to state assessment are, was probably the most tangible piece that I got out of that. Um, and it sounded from the other folks that were in the room and kind of talking about it that everybody's a little anxious to see how that's all going to play out and you know how we're going to use that data and compare it to past years when it's different and doing it in the spring versus the fall and has a whole lot of challenges. and. Uh, um, the paper and pencil versus on a computer and it kind of sounded like you had a choice at the beginning but they sort of intimated that that choice wasn't going to last very long like maybe two years um, so that's kind of a thing to think about too so that was the one that kind of hit home as far as a, a tangible thing that's going to affect us you know in the classroom um, the, uh, nobody really talked about some of the the keynote talks um, they really I guess to sum it up, they really emphasize that it's just a different world now than it used to be um, technology-wise, the different generation gaps that we have. Um, and it's, I, th I felt like a lot of it was trying to put us in other people's shoes to kind of see what it's like from the other side. Um, I, I, I do have that, you know, kids these days get off my lawn mentality sometimes. So um, it was kind of a nice reflection to kind of think about what, what the, why it's different for uh, the new generations and just the technical world and social media world that we live in um, and be conscious of that in all of your interactions. So that, that was a nice kind of just reminder of, you know, it's not what it was like when we were kids in school. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that you have to be aware of in pretty much all of your <laughs> daily activities. So, so that, I thought that was a nice part too. Yeah, and I, I've asked uh, when I came back. I talked to Steve about getting that assessments. They can present it to us so we can all hear about it. I did think that was definitely important. Uh, when I went to my uh, child's um, sixth grade conference, I mean, we did the conference and then started talking about assessments. So I know it's on the minds of uh, teachers here as well. Uh, and then also, you did touch on the uh, keynotes, and I'll just say it. the the second one that we heard, Kevin Honeycutt. I'm the, the nerd that went home and watched a presentation of his on YouTube, mm -hmm. which is pretty much the same presentation just because I enjoyed it and I wanted to hear it again. So uh, I recommend that one to uh, those of you who didn't go. Uh, his name's Kevin Honeycutt. Look it up on YouTube. So good, good talk. You were there too, Steve? Any comments from you? I'll leave it up with yours. Okay. I'm sorry, but can you go on record? What exactly was Craig's award? And do you remember? I'm sorry. I looked for it, and I can't find okay. the exact title for it. So we'll, we'll have to send that out to you. It's a major award. <laughs> well, I, I'd say the major award, and I didn't say it at the time. And I want to thank Craig and Les and the team is the AAA rating. Seriously. I think that says a lot about yeah. what's going on. So thank you. Really? Only district in the state. That's fantastic. Um, OK, that's great. Thank you, Paul, for having that added to the agenda. That was really a good overview. Um, moving to presentations, Diane, we're going to hear uh, about the World Language Curriculum Review. Of course, one of the favorite things that my curriculum coordinators do is present to the board. And I'm kind of anxiously waiting. You just made her wait a little bit longer. But, um, hopefully, you'll be kind to her as she's um, ready to tell you about our curriculum review. So we had World Language was up last year. Paul was a member of the committee as well. Um, and throughout that curriculum review, we end up with um, just a whole bunch of input from community, from parents, from students, from teachers through a survey. Um, we have a lot of different individuals involved in the committee. And our goal is to really come up with a, 
a list of strengths and then a list of limitations um, and then a, a plan to move forward to make improvements in the curriculum as we're always improving um, with everything we do. And one of the best, I think, outcomes of, that I've seen in a, in a review it will be the seal of biliteracy that um, Carmen's going to present to you tonight. So it's an exciting program for us to be able to offer to our students, and I'll kind of turn it over here to Carmen. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you, Diane. As Anne mentioned, um, I will keep this extremely brief for you. So there was the three main things that we did. We just did a textbook adoption, so we got new materials for our French and Spanish programs. And we also acquired some additional resources to complement our one-to-one use of the Chromebooks for our students. So they have additional materials at home that they can continue to practice with their language studies and use. So I'm gonna just quickly talk about the COBA literacy. That is one, I think that will answer your question right now also as to the level five program. Because the COBA literacy opens up for us to allow for our students who are currently studying world languages. We have a five year language program. And so our students who are currently level four moving on to level five will be able to achieve the COBA literacy at the end of that year with, there's some criteria that they'll have to meet. One of them would be an assessment that they will have to take at the end of the school year um, in addition to receiving the COBA literacy, but that is something that will be approved. It's already been approved by the state of Iowa. It will be a seal that will go on their transcript that says that they have acquired proficiency in two or more languages. And so I'm gonna show, I think I can click on the website yep. from here. Um, just briefly show you a website that we're putting together for the district that will have more information on the COBA literacy for parents and for students to have access to. We're still in the development process of this, but the goal is to implement this in um, 2019, and so for the next school year. And our students will be in that, the students currently enrolled in level four moving into level five will be completing all the requirements in that class to then achieve the CO by the end of that graduation year. Um, this also allows for our EL students. So we have a lot of our EL students in the community who are already proficient in their native language. And so as they're achieving mastery in their English language skills, they will also be able to continue using their native language and then at the end of that, show proficiency of that language, of English and their native language, and then be able also to achieve the CO by literacy by the end um, before they graduate. So that will be on their transcript um, and they can use that for college admissions but also as they go into the job force they can show that they're bilingual and biliterate um, and have proficiency in more than one language. So that's the biggest piece of it for us. It shows, you can see, I think I have link, if you have access to the website you should be able to see through the link there's um, different uh, requirements that we're still currently working on. Nothing has been set in stone yet. So as a team of world language teachers, we are gonna be working also with guidance counselors, with our administrators, with some students and some parents, and also with um, just community members to try and figure out just different ways that we can connect our students with their language. The biggest part that we got out of our improvement plan meetings as we got together, um, and Paul, like I said, was part of that group, the biggest part was that we wanted to connect our students with the use of the language. So they're studying world languages for four or five years and wanted to make sure that was purposeful for them. So as they go into the workforce, as they go into their community, we wanted to provide them also awarding them recognition of their use of language in their studies, but also showing them that their language study has a purpose and that they can go into that workforce actually using their language right away. So our goal is to find connections and work with our community members to provide those opportunities for our students to get out there and use their language and see their language being effective as they're in high school and see the use of that language being there for them. Um, one of our biggest piece I wanna say is we, for the World Language Program as we're going through our improvement plan, we saw a big piece of not having, we currently don't have a heritage learners program in place so by initiating the COBA literacy also provides room for our EL students for the Heritage Learners Program and kind of creating a room or a space for our students to also know that that language that they currently have, their native language is valued and showing our students, our EL students, that they can progress with that in, their, in our community as we're growing and for the Iowa City School District. So as I promised, I was gonna keep this brief. So I'm just gonna open up to see if you have any questions with us. Yeah, on, on the curriculum that you purchased, were they actual books or is it uh, uh, 
web-based or is it on the Chromebooks exactly? We purchase both. Okay. So we purchase actual books that students can have. Um, they will have classes, but they can also take books home. So each student has a copy of the textbook, but then they also has the online access to the textbook too. Okay. And in addition to that, we get additional um, online resources that they can use to improve their language skills at home. Right, and and uh, you know I, uh, I'm going through and, and looking at this. There, there, we've got a lot of challenges, and and the one thing you know, getting kids to, to practice the language in in those instances, I can just say in a household where they did, my daughter didn't have to go to the next room to get two people, three people to help her with her language, uh, that was difficult then too. But we do have unique opportunities in our community, especially with Spanish and French, uh, to take advantage of, of native speakers and, and opportunities, just going, uh, taking the class to uh, Lorena yes. with a, uh, a list of uh, things to get mm -hmm. uh, and to price them out, I think would be a great activity and things to get them out in the community and, and get working with their languages. But uh, from, uh, from the board, what, uh, what are you looking for? What, what do you want from us as far as help and support uh, pushing, pushing this and, and uh, is, there, is there something, some things we can be doing to help you? The biggest help is the support. So understand that we have the support of the board to push through with this. Um, our biggest connections would be community. Like you said, just finding different community connections and different ways that we can get our students out there in the community to use their language. Um, our goal, and I'm gonna throw this out there, but our goal is to also, I know with losing the seventh grade program, our goal is as students pro improve their proficiency in language, we'll love to be able to give them more years of language study. So for students to be fully bilingual, fully biliterate, and, um, and show proficiency in language, the biggest goal is to be able to provide them more years of that language study, and so that will be um, our biggest push throughout the years is that we want, I think we mentioned, we wanted to be, what Laurie mentioned earlier about building and creating and helping guiding our students to be global citizens. And part of that is having more bilingual students um, that we can do as a district. And so having more years of language study and providing more opportunities for students to continue learning languages will be the biggest support we can get. Well, and along those lines, you know, we've been having uh, discussions of magnets and whether they're year-round or something like that, a language uh, uh, magnet school. Um, any thoughts on that potential? I, we're going to have opportunities to, <laughs> to, to, to talk about it, but yes. just keep, you know, uh, yeah. when, when we get into those discussions, please uh, uh, come in and uh, give us your perspective on, on the opportunities there. I know what West Liberty does. Uh, with their dual uh, language curriculum is, is uh, from, from people I've talked to, um, is very successful and, yeah. and uh, very uh, helpful in, in uh, all students. Yes, that is true. And I mean, just on that, what you mentioned, I guess the more, and whether you know we have discussions about a whole magnet idea, but I think the more we can do uh, to get foreign language in elementary schools um, is, is critical. I mean, and that's something I hear feedback from the community quite a bit, mm -hmm. is why, and, and it's not just criticism of Iowa City, usually it's like America, like why don't you teach kids language starting in kindergarten? And so I'm, uh, <coughs> obviously that has its own considerations and resource allocation and all that, but I, I know that's something I'd be interested in looking at and, and hear a lot about, so. Comments or questions? Uh, just real quick. Um, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for leading this curriculum review. It was the, the first one that I had done as a board member and uh, it was very informative. It was, I will admit, for me it was frustrating. Not, not your group. Uh, frustrating because um, I've said it a lot. I feel like we cut languages when we should be adding. And, uh, you know, we, we had... Uh, Lots of talks about that, and um, one of the things that we talked about was that option, uh, uh, trying to add in an option in seventh grade where students could try languages, the two, well, now two that we have to find one that they may mm -hmm. like instead of starting one way and then either dropping it all together or, or switching. Uh, and secondly, they, they kind of talked about it with uh, the magnets, but I would really love to see one of our schools become dual immersion school, dual language immersion school. Um, I think that would be excellent in this community. 
Any additional questions for me? Thank you very much. Right, thank, you. It. thank you. Moving on to the quarterly financial report. Leslie, you're up. Yeah. Um, I'll just a uh, couple com quick comments uh, regarding uh, what's presented in your packet. It's through September 30th. Uh, we have all of the budget information uh, entered for the year. Um, we've projected out on page, I believe it's page 10, uh, where we're going in a very conservative approach. You can see there's some negative looking numbers there that uh, we need to address. And as Craig alluded to earlier, that will be part of the, the presentation to the board uh, that the administrative team will, will work through you with uh, next week at the December 4th uh, meeting. Uh, the, the dashboard has up, been updated for the tax information for fiscal 19. Uh, the fiscal 18 expenditure levels that compare across districts and rank us is not yet available because the Department of Ed hasn't uh, finalized those numbers from all of the certified annual reports. But other than that, I'll take any other questions. Well, I've got one, just one question, and uh, it came from a from staff and uh, right now we've got a very uh, aggressive and uh, rewarding early retirement incentive uh, for staff um, where's that money coming from what 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 funding source from the management fund from the management fund yes okay I will yeah. Iowa code 279 uh, provides for a district board of education to offer an early retirement plan uh, monetary and uh, insurance incentives to uh, staff to incent a, um, a person to retire prior to the regular retirement age, which they define as 65 uh, in, in code nine, uh, Iowa Code 97B. And so um, uh, as a part of that, uh, those incentives, if the individual is uh, um, older than 55 or older, you can actually pay for those incentives out of the management fund, and it's not a cost to your general fund. So that's why uh, it's an attractive option when it comes to uh, uh, what we're trying to accomplish in, in uh, a reducing costs in our general fund is that if we can incent some uh, of our uh, more senior staff to uh, uh, enjoy retirement and then uh, backfill those positions with lower cost employees, then you get that turnover savings and that's something uh, that we're uh, trying to achieve in the early retirement program. Right, uh, the, the, only, the only downside to that is you lose your veterans and, and, and some of that institutional knowledge. You do and, lose institutional knowledge, no doubt about it. And, yep. and, and that, now are the incentives we're offering now, uh, and because I, I, this has been a, a program we've had for, for a long time, but are the incentives now somehow sweeter because, I, like I say, the, the buzz is that, boy, this is very attractive. Are, are they better than in years past? We've had uh, an early retirement program in place for over 15 years, okay. and uh, it, it's even a part of our contractual agreement uh, with our teachers, even though we can't talk about that now with Chapter 20 changes and things like that. But, <laughs> but nonetheless... Uh, there's a, there is a, a core level, what I would say a base level for the early retirement plan. And then uh, management each year, um, based on decisions that, that we are looking at the budget like we are this year, uh, we've offered uh, various types of enhancements. This year uh, is one of those years we felt like uh, we needed uh, a lot of help uh, from our staff in turnover. And so it was enriched this year. Um, a little bit beyond where it was last year. And one of those main components is the uh, offering of uh, a single health insurance uh, as a part of uh, separation where the district would pay that single health insurance till 65. That's not been offered for about 10 years. Um, it, uh, that particular piece has been offered in the past, but the last 10 years it hasn't been part of our early retirement plan. I have a quick question, Craig, on the um, uh, per student operational. Um, do you expect that to improve with the closure of Hoover? 
the per student operational costs? I mean, because the, the legend says it's because we've got a lot of smaller, older buildings and that raises that operational expense. Yeah, that's a direct result of um, uh, what, I, what I would term, and this is just Craig Hansel, it's a small bit building syndrome. Um, when you use uh, a, a lot of small buildings to educate your children, you, you have a lot more costs involved for the maintenance or operation side. Um, Iowa City has chosen to keep uh, all of its buildings in play. Um, and uh, when you compare it to a model like uh, a Johnston or an Ankeny or a Waukee, where they have just as many elementary kids in half the number of, of elementary buildings we do, uh, you'll see that their costs in, on that dashboard as comparison are bright green and, and ours are orange because of the additional facility costs that, that it takes for us to, uh, and, that's, and that's a part of our general fund budget. And will that improve though when we close Hoover? Will we see any modification there? Will it go to from there is, orange to yellow maybe? There, there is roughly, we, we've calculated it out, there's about a half a million dollar savings uh, by uh, a year uh, that con you know every year compounds itself in a, in savings for closing a, a building right okay. thank you mm -hmm. any other questions from directors Maybe none. is there a motion to approve oh this is not an action i guess we're done uh, agenda setting yeah okay um very good so we're on agenda setting as paul said uh we'll look at the work session for next tuesday which is the budget craig that you'll be walking through with us and we'll talk about those projected negative numbers you just highlighted um or leslie highlighted in, in anything else for that work session that directors would like to see i think that's probably going to take the bulk of the time right um the next item would be the exempt session um, that's because we're moving into the negotiations. Moving into negotiation season, so we yep. want to make sure we get that kicked off. Yep. Uh, and then the meeting itself on the 11th. Um, everything seems uh, uh, fairly straight straightforward into the presentations. We've got a whole pile of presentations. Right. Um, Just a, a reminder on that, these are uh, presentations that we've pushed forward mm -hmm. uh, and consolidated. So we've got a couple meetings where the presentation's in there, not unlike, and I believe we already lost Carmen, um, but uh, not unlike uh, Carmen this evening, um, we've already talked to the team about getting the presentations done and uploaded. So you have the opportunity to review mm -hmm. them, spend, little or in some cases no time at the podium, but just give you the opportunity as board members to provide questions uh, that you have for uh, the teams. If you have any questions ahead of time, feel free to send those in. Then when it becomes their turn for their presentation, they'll simply say, question received from Paul, here's the answer. Question received from Lori, here's the answer. But really try to keep them away from the podium as much as possible so we can keep things clipping along. Not that we don't want to hear from them, I but understood. it's just a compressed yep. set of um, presentations in that yep. next meeting. And I know that meeting's full, and, and December, the December meeting is always the full one. That's the one that normally sets the record. Uh, but uh, um, I, I would like to uh, have a uh, brief update on uh, ag education uh, as far as staffing and uh, facilities, that type of a thing, and uh, that'd be okay for that, uh, Matt. It wouldn't have to be very big, right? Yeah, we can, yeah. Just a verbal update, you know? I mean, it doesn't need right. to be a presentation yep. Yep. or anything. Just right. Exactly, update. and and we're going to be discussing some of that at the Ed Committee, uh, which is... December 18th. December 18th, so it's kind of just a... So primer on that, and then that... If we're discussing it at Ed Committee, do we need to have a topic on the 11th? I'm sure that's the well topic for the 18th. The topic for the 18th on the Ed Committee, I believe, is the Teacher Leadership Program. Okay. January, I think we're going to come back with Ethnic Studies and Ag, if I'm remembering right. JP and I have exchanged a couple of emails about that with the agendas for the next several months. That was going to be at the registration time of the season, so that's why we thought it was appropriate to take those electives at that time. Um, but I can definitely provide a verbal okay. update at the next meeting about where we're at. So the so the Ed Committee is going to be in January when they're, is it going to be before or after they start registering? Um, that'll probably be in the midst of registration would be my guess, Phil. Kids pretty much start that as soon as they come back from I, January. I understand. So, well, yep. my, my, my only concern was is that we get that out ahead of time and, and so decisions aren't made before people find out about it. But. 
Well, I mean, the one thing is, and no disrespect, but kids aren't going to sign up based on what you guys say at a meeting, probably. So <laughs> yeah. we're going to need to do some things but. internally uh, to, to promote that <laughs> class. And so we they can got, definitely provide know, any update you want, but that'll be on available. us to get registration numbers. Yep. So we'll have a brief verbal next meeting, um, and then the Ed Committee in January will go into more depth with the two uh, new courses that we're adding. Cool. Anything else? I think we need to add back in an action item on a voluntary transfer vote because we tabled it. Definitely. Very good. Yes. Good catch. Um, that would be on the 11th. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Good catch. And um, we'll need some language developed uh, for that. Um, we'll have that ready and uploaded shortly. Tonight too, right? Then so we can, can maybe give some direction to the language. Yeah, we have a I've draft. Very brief. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep. I think I've got a good handle on what you're looking for, so I yeah. think we can yeah. get that drafted up pretty quick. Perfect. Okay, and we'll add that as an action item for December 11th. Perfect. Good catch. Thanks, Sean. Anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.